On this episode of Kilts and Culture with USA Kilts, we put two classic Irish whiskeys to the test. We go Jameson versus Bushmills. <laughs> All right. Hello, boys and girls. Welcome to Kilts and Culture. I'm Rocky. This is Eric. Yo. Today, special treat, mm -hmm. as we always do. It's always we a special have treat. Head to head, Jameson Irish Whiskey versus the Compender, or Contender, Competitor, both. Competitor. Competitor. Bushmills. Bam. Take that in the microphone, Coraline. The, uh, right in the <clears throat> microphone. Yeah. So, yes, we wanted to do something in advance of St. Patrick's Day. So we figured what better to try is putting our scotch aside for a day and trying some Irish whiskeys. The, probably the most common Irish whiskeys. Yeah. So we're going to put them way to put it. head to head. See which one for your dollar is better or worse. Or are they both wonderful or do they both kind of suck? We're going to find out. The, um, uh, this, I believe, was what, $26.99? Somewhere, somewhere in there, and yeah, yeah, And this is yeah. $21 or $22.99? Yeah. So, both of them, very affordable, lower end, so... Lower shelf, you could lower say. Lower shelf. Yeah. Fair. <laughs> at, a, at a bar, though, mid-shelf. Yeah, man, yeah, yeah. <laughs> So, and to, to imbibe the off-coveted, the highly sought-after USA Kilts, Glenn Caring Glasses. Mr. Mac, would you like to come and collect? If you would be so kind. If you would be so kind. Pretty please, sir. So. Mac is our Irish rover here today. We'll do. I'm a roving. Put these in one hand. Yep. And then put these in the other hand. Good. Uh, we'll we'll see. Right. Okay. All right, Mr. Eric. Yeah, I'm going to. I don't want to. Yeah, I don't want to disturb the. Let me put we'll the balls together a little bit. All right. Just kind of like make it look all pretty for you. Yeah, all, all, all right. fancy. All right. Fancy schmancy. <clears throat> all right. And I am going to. I can't help it, guys. I still got to do this. It's just how I roll. <laughs> so I do my little opening thing. That was a little too much. It may not make a difference. So this is the Jameson. All right. Mac. Smell. We're gonna start with a Jameson. Both of believe, yeah. We're gonna start with Jameson. Smell it. What do you smell? How does it make you feel? I feel like in an Irish pub. No. It reminds me of hairspray. <laughs> 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 like that's that's what it reminds me of. <laughs> okay. Yeah, like grandmom's hairspray. Yeah. Because it's got like a little bit of a floral kind of mm -hmm. hmm. scent to it. I was gonna be Perfumey. kinder than that. That's gonna be kind of like, hey, whatever it smells Nose like. Isn't too bad. Yeah, there's a little bit. All right, Coraline, what's it smell like to you aside from turpentine? I think the hairspray analogy is really good. Hairspray, dish soap. It smells exactly like what I had when we had the, did the haggis dry. Um, because it all tastes and smells the same. Oh, okay. So, okay, but fair disclosure though, what we had during the haggis try was was it Lagavulin? No, it was gl uh, Glamorangi. Glamorangi. So, yeah. your, your, your Coraline's perspective is a little bit different. Or a little bit okay. standardized, perhaps. I don't know. I'm almost I wanna say licorice y kind of but I'm think it's it's kinda of wrong. I don't know. Alright, down the hatch. Sancha. I don't dislike it as much as I thought I would, to be honest. But there's not much to it. I'm I gonna, got I got gonna, sweetness. Yeah, it's a lot of sweetness. I'm gonna agree. It's it's kind of got a weird, like, pins and needles kind of aftertaste. It's like, you know, it's like poking my tongue almost. It's very um, short. Are you familiar with that term? Yeah, it doesn't linger. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it doesn't, the, the flavor is not going further back into my mouth or, you know, across my palate. Yeah. Mac, have you tasted yet? Yeah, I have. And did you just shoot it or did you? No, I still have a little, okay. uh, not much, but still got a little. But I agree with both what you're saying. It's you definitely feel it. I feel it in the front of, like, front to middle tongue. That like sharpness, yeah. and then it just yeah, that's that where sugar. it dies off. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So not uh, not complex. Not, not complex at all. But I'd say this: reasonably smooth. Like I don't get the 
kind of, you know, kick in the back of the mouth that like, uh, true. Now I cut mine a little bit to bring, to bring the, the esters out. Yeah. The, so I can't judge the smoothness exactly, but it's, uh, I'd mix with it. Yeah. I'd still, I'd give it like a five, four. Like I'm not. 5.4? Yeah. I'm not. That middle, high. I'm not. It's yeah, middle, like middle okay. of the road for me. Okay. Worth noting, Mac has had a cold this week also. So maybe we're just cutting through the sinus congestion. That could be. Could be helping. Yeah. <laughs> Coraline. Um, two. I don't know. I, I thought it was awful, but I'm not the person to ask. I don't want to be too mean. Two. You could be mean. You can be as mean as you want. Yeah, that's okay. <clears throat> that could be her persona. She's going to be the mean one. <laughs> Everyone's a little bit mean it's for St. Patrick's Day. Wait, no, that's not. Everybody's a little bit Irish for St. Patrick's yes. Day. Yes. Eric. Three. Three point nine. I'll be nice. Three point nine. Three point nine. Okay, you moved it up almost to full point. All right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm trying to be nice, and and it's like, if I wanted to get a very basic whiskey kind of a caramely whiskey vibe to a cocktail, I could see maybe using this to mix with. That's a fair point. Yeah, that's but point. that's usually my perspective. Um, it is not complete on its own. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah just because there's not a lot of depth to it. Yeah. Um. 3.3, three, I think is a, it's, it's below average. I wouldn't go out of my way to buy it. Um, if somebody handed it to me and said, hey, do a shot. Sure. Or if somebody said, you know, hey, do you want a, a, a Guinness or a, a, a you know, a, a rocks glass with some Jameson? I'd take the Jameson over the Guinness because I'm not a big stout guy. Oh, I would um, totally go with the Guinness, but I, know I, am, you a, would. I am a stout guy. Yes. So, so yeah, say three, three. It's, it's fine. Both um, of these are old. That that's that's well, the one thing they do have. They do have a, a yeah. James uh, claim is that it's the world's first Irish whiskey. But yeah, seventeen eighty. Yeah, I like how it's laying that claim. But Bushmills mm -hmm. is laying the claim to sixteen oh eight. Yeah, and um, I read some of that too. And the thing about Bushmills is that was sixteen oh eight was when the first license was given to an Irish distiller to legally distill. Aquavitae, basically just distill whiskey, um, and that was given by you King James, on. King James the first. So, mm -hmm. but yeah, they've had they've had all kinds of issues. They've had fires, and so they had to rebuild and rebrand the company. Right, the company, right. Yeah, they had the, the whole. It's story. not continuous. There's been gaps, yeah, right? Which right, right. that's why mm -hmm. <coughs> Jameson okay. lays that claim. Yeah, I don't think Jameson was contiguous <coughs> either. Although um, they were actually the funny thing with Jameson is that I guess it was the he was actually from Scotland. The, the guy, the, the original John Jameson or whatever, he and his wife were Scottish and she, her family were distillers also. So they that, kind of imported the... Yeah, and that brings us to the other, uh, the most common misconception about Jameson and Bushmills. The other reason we wanted to do mm -hmm. this. Yep, yep. Um, there is a, a nasty rumor, or at least pretends, people think it's true. Urban it's legend. Not. Urban legend. There yep. you go. Yeah. Um, that Jameson is the Catholic whiskey and Bushmills is the Protestant whiskey. Um, not really. Um, basically, it's Jameson is from County Cork, and Bushmills is from Ulster. Therefore, this is from the north, where there are more Protestants, and people like to kind of draw that connection, mostly Americans. It's not really a thing that's talked about in mm -hmm. Ireland. Um, but it's, yeah, it's, it's not true. Yeah, I mean, uh, Coraline fa had found one article that uh, <coughs> was a bartender in Chicago who uh, said that his, uh, according to his uh, distributor for Bushmill, their chief distiller at the time of the writing was at, was Catholic. So there's no clear lines here, you know? Yeah. I mean, uh, Bushmill is still, I guess, made in County Antrim. Um, and so it is, it is, uh, it's from, it's Belfast based, basically. And they don't use the river water for the whole process anymore, but they do, they use, river water from up there from yeah from the bush mill the 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 river bush uh for their finishing water at least for like the last part of the process and jameson actually started in dublin and they moved to cork and and i think yeah i think we both ran into this factoid um but uh, they moved to cork sometime in like the 19th century was that yeah it? i believe that's when it was yeah and yeah along with a bunch of other distillers so yeah and they're owned by what french yeah pinard Ricard, Captain Picard, Pernod, something like that. Yes. Pernard, Jean-Luc yeah, Picard. Okay. Sure, okay. It's Don't French. I'm not French, so currently owns Jameson. Yes, 
Jameson, sorry. Maybe if I drink more, I'll and sound is, better. And is, is Bushmill Irish owned or is they, they... are owned by an English firm. Um, Giorgio or? Yeah, and then okay. that seems to also be a... DiGiorno? Oh. <laughs> it's not delivery. <laughs> That's Italian. All right. Um, yeah, then they're owned by Jose Cuero on top of that. Sweet. So, tequila and wine. Yeah. Or champagne. One of the two. Um, so, all right, next. Champagne. Let's move on to the Bushmills. Okay. Bushmills now. A lot lighter. I got Quonset Palette again. It smells sweeter. Coraline has a wonderful <laughs> reaction to this. <laughs> so We put her through a lot. We do. It's fun. It's fun torturing people. Wow, that's a lot sweeter. <clears throat> Harsher. There's more burn. Definitely more burn. Yeah. Wow. But back further. It's further back yeah. like, towards yep. my throat more. Yep. Where Jameson's is more towards the front. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's it's Bernie. <laughs> now I know that one of the one of the differences between Irish whiskey and Scotch is that um they tend to mix um some of the in the Yolda's in necessarily during the, 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 the leaner times for the industry, they didn't use any malt because of uh, the corn laws, the British corn laws. So they were using wheat, corn, to make, uh, and things to make the, and barley to make the, uh, wait, am I getting that wrong? I think I'm getting it wrong. I have no idea. There's a difference between, basically, it's not malt whiskey. Okay. I guess is, is, is my understanding. It's, it tends to be a blend at best of some malted and some not because there was a, there were taxes on, uh, right. on, on, on grains okay. imposed by the, by the English. Um, which impacted the Irish whiskey industry. Okay. So that's, I think that's probably where they diverted from the scotch. Yeah, from the scotch. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> All right, Mr. Mack, Bushmills, one to 10. I'm going to give this one a 6.4. I like this one a little bit better. Do you know? Really? I like, I think I like the, the, the bite back further than being towards the front. They taste, I think the taste wise, they're very similar, but I think yeah. it's where the bite is okay Coraline another three um this feels like a prank and you put the same thing in two different glasses <laughs> <laughs> we would never do that <clears throat> just Adam all right Eric um I'm gonna give it 2.7 I actually like the Jameson better out of the two of them it's okay that's fair. It has nothing to do with me going to Catholic high school. It's fair. I would... I would probably say 2.3. Um, yeah, not a fan. And I would say this. I think we need to come up with uh, parts of the scale where we have on the upper end, 8 and above is where you would actually drive somewhere to get the thing. Yeah, we said that last um, month actually about what we were trying then. I'm doing the lower end of the scale okay. where I'm going to say two and below, you politely refuse. Okay. Um, that's It's going to be my new throw, kind of throw gauge it on, where Throw it on the campfire. Are. Woo! Yeah. For special effect. I don't think it would, no, I don't think it would burn. It wouldn't, it wouldn't go up. It has to be over a hundred proof. What's the proof? 40%. So, nope. This would put out the fire. It would not catch on fire. I'll go back to my Jameson for a minute. So, did you start the fire though? It was Which always burning since the world's been turned some, back. Some varieties that people have recommended that you check out, and we may try and explore this in the future, would include uh, Canapog, which I'm mispronouncing, Canapew Castle, uh, Redbreast, which I actually, I've had Redbreast, and that would be my preferred Irish whiskey, actually. Uh, Middleton, the Sexton, I've had, Sexton's a little harsher, um, but I wouldn't mind trying that on the show. I'd be interested to know what you think of that. <clears throat> I okay. think Sexton and Redbreast would be a, a fun try. No, no, comparison. please don't make me drink. Okay. Um, and then, yeah, and Black Barrel, Green Spot, Yellow Spot, and Slain. If you want to check out some other Irish whiskeys besides the base, um, that those are some of the recommendations from our folks on Facebook. If you Thank have you any, guys. If you have any more of the Jameson left, when I drank my last little sip there, I got a lot of caramel. I had getting, I was getting caramel notes before. Yeah. Mac, do you have any left or can you smell, yeah. smell your empty glass? Still there. Does it smell caramel? 
Like, I yeah. got a, like a strong caramel, but I didn't get it on the original. It was when I just let it sit for a few minutes. In fairness, we didn't let it sit. We just opened it up. Well, and I and um, I had watered mine. You had not watered yours, right? So mm -hmm. I think I may have picked up on that sooner because I had watered mine. But okay. I think that's I think the problem is the lack of complexity is really what it boils down to. There's really yeah. just not much there. Yeah. It's it's fire water. You know. It is. Yeah. Alright. Let's clear off the Yeah, yeah. The the set. Oh. And we have a new angle on things. Ah. Um God. the uh yeah, we wanted to monkey around with the studio a little bit. Um, and show you guys a different oh, oh your, your look what I did. master blender. That's <laughs> um, we wanted to show a different angle of the studio, um, showcase some of the uh, tartan registration stuff that we've done before, um, and yeah, just show something different. So hopefully it's not obnoxious, um, but I don't really think it matters that much. I think I'm way. Oh, tell us what you place. think. Yeah, yeah, that. The best angle we had on the studio, in my opinion, was uh, when we had Kilmaine Saints here. Saturday. Those with the lights out. No. <laughs> but bump. That depends on who you're with. Yes. But the but uh, we had a really fun time last weekend with the uh, Killing Saints coming to visit. Oh yeah. yeah, yeah. And that video is now I believe <coughs> on the YouTube's. If you want to see it, if you haven't, if you didn't catch it live. Um, really cool band. They just did a really cool acoustic EP uh, for St. Patrick's Day. So. Yep. Yes. Yeah. It's Indeed. it's fun. That's the cool thing about having the space is being able to do stuff Some like fun that. Fun different stuff. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's, it's that's that's what it's about. Yep. We got to develop more. More nooks and crannies of the room. All right. All right. That being said, boys and girls, load in your questions. Uh, Mr. Mac will feed them to us, and we will answer them live on air. We're going to start with Mr. Eric. Yep, yep. Who has questions from previous shows that we didn't get around to answering. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. here we go. I have, a couple of, I have a couple of new ones also. Um, okay. uh, I'll start real simple. Uh, Mike? Mike? Uh, said his band kilt gets a lot of wear and is frequently iron pressed to remove the wrinkles. Is it okay to spray starch the kilt when he's ironing it, like on medium heat or a steam mist kind of a thing? I mean, should he be bothering to starch his kilt? Because it's taking a lot of abuse as a parade kilt, I guess is what I'm saying. No. No? No. No. Just, no. Um, you don't even really need to necessarily iron it. If it's just wrinkles um, from a parade, <clears throat> you can steam it out. Um, you can if it's if the front apron, like a section that's supposed to be flat, is wrinkled, take it into your bathroom with the shower, turn the shower on super hot or super hot that way, um, and just hang it near the shower. Let the room steam up real nice, um, and just it'll kind of relax some of the minor wrinkles wrinkles out of it. If the pleats are what is kind of fakakta a little bit, and you sat on the kilt and you got weird creases in the back, um, what I would suggest is get a handkerchief. Um, not necessarily a bandana, because you may want to worry about color fastness. Hmm. Um, but get a handkerchief, a white one, get it wet or damp, and then lay the kilt out, you know, straighten out all the pleats, lay the damp handkerchief on the back of the pleats, and then with your iron on a medium setting, make sure you're not going to, you know, singe the wool. Um, you basically press on the, uh, on the handkerchief to, you know, help put some water and put some steam into the kilt. Um, and to kind of relax the wrinkles a little bit. Okay. Yeah, I mean, the one thing that Mike did not mention was whether or not the kilt was a hand-me-down or not. And I'd be willing to bet that if it's older kilt, a hand-me-down kilt, it, it may never have been properly pressed again. You know, sometimes, you know, some guys yeah. try to take care of the stuff. Some guys don't. They just, it's like, it's what they're supposed <coughs> to wear when they're in the band. So they just have it and wear it. So, yeah, I think maybe how often should you be doing a, a deep clean or an overhaul on a band kilt? Like if it's a, if it's one of the ones that, you know what I mean? Cause we've Before seen some, you get a hand me down. Definitely. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, Cause we've seen some kids <clears throat> are like 20 years oh, old. Yeah. You know, I was out older. With, I was out at a uh, flyers game last night with Dan Brumbach mm -hmm. has had his kilt for 15 years. He wears it as a badge of honor that he's never washed his kilt. <sighs> yes. Like, Dan, when the kilt is standing up on its own, it's time to wash the kilt. No, no, it's fine. It's fine. It doesn't smell or nothing. Well, it is wool, uh, so it won't retain odor like other fabrics do, but yeah. still. I think he actually has a PV kilt, but either oh, way. Oh, God. <laughs> either yeah, way, definitely wash your washed. kilt more than once every 15 years. Um, yeah. Somewhere between every time you wear it and every 15 years. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's a you know, small gap. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah, it should be basically every 
few times you wear it, or if you wear it and you're sweating a lot every few times you wear it, yeah. versus if you just wear it for an hour for a gig in a indoor air conditioned room, you're not sweating at all, and you've laid it flat on the back of the you know back of a chair to dry overnight and kind of let the gases you know gas off. Um, it'll be fine for you know ten times wearing it, I guess. Mm -hmm. If it's okay. as long as it's not dirty and you're not really sweating in it. Mm -hmm. But otherwise, and if you're doing it for parade season, I guarantee you're sweating in the kilt. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, cool. Wow. 15 years. <sighs> okay. Okay. Glad well, I'm not his mom. But a little bit of steam pressing if you think it needs it is, is yeah, fine. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. But yeah, but not don't starch. starch you it. wouldn't starch it. Nah. Yeah. It's starches will hold a crease better or hold a, you know, hold the position you give it better. So I would almost be concerned that if you try to starch, let's say, the pleats of the kilt, that when you sit on them, it's going to retain that because your body yeah. heat pushing down the, the pressure and the heat yeah. of your body will actually make it crease worse. Um, I can see that. Yeah. You'd have to test it, but I don't, I don't intend yeah. to. Yeah, me neither. <laughs> don't do it. Yeah. There you go. Mr. Mac. All <clears throat> right. Since we are talking about... Uh... For the record, coffee and breath mints and Jameson, horrible. <laughs> Much worse than my, my normal combination. The coffee kind of burned going down. Yeah, but how many breath mints did you put into the blender before you... <sighs> no, like, it's... Yeah, I don't know. Okay, anyway. <clears throat> Sorry, <throat> Matt, go ahead. That's all right. So, uh, we have a question uh, coming from Lord Mac Kent. Um, he says, here's, okay, here's a question for the lads. Here in the UK, at the moment, it's very wet. What's the best way to waterproof the kilt? It's wool. Not. You just don't. Yeah. It's pretty simple. Yeah, I mean... Do you see sheep running around with Teflon spray on them? No. Um, honestly, don't worry about it. The wool is naturally kind of a... You know, the lanolin, the, the oils and the, you know, whatever in lanolin, mm -hmm. or in, in wool, lanolin, mm -hmm. <clears throat> will actually repel water a bit. It doesn't absorb water like cotton will or something like that. So I wouldn't worry about it. It kind of sheds water naturally. And if it gets a little bit wet, it gets wet. And no amount of waterproofing Teflon coating is going to stop it, really. Yeah, I'd well, be, I'd be if really you dip it in a vat of Teflon. Maybe, I just wouldn't but... want to do that to the to the fabric anyway. Yeah, frankly, I mean, I think less chemicals is better. <clears throat> yeah. Um, maybe you're dealing with a, a particularly damp situation, and you just feel like the kilt is wet, hanging on your body somehow. Um, but I, yeah, I don't think you really waterproof wool. Nope. Really. Um, think about your overlayers if it's really coming down. Um, or think about uh, a warmth layer under the kilt if you're feeling cold because of a damp cold. But the kilt itself should probably just be left. Yeah, I'd as say is. if it's if you're worried because it's damp or it's raining or whatever, then that means you're probably outside. If it's not raining inside, or else you have bigger issues. Um, in that case, get a rain cape. Get something an Inverness cape yeah. like bagpipers wear yeah. that actually is water repellent. It's a rain cape or a rain jacket effectively. Mm -hmm. It's just extra long to cover the kilt. Um, and it's got a lot of range of motion in the arms. Think of like what Sherlock Holmes wore kind of thing. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that would be a more appropriate way to deal with wet conditions. You know, you know, throw on a pair of wellies, you know, conditions permitting or, or not permitting conditions dictating. Yeah, I wouldn't wear wellies to the office necessarily. They're not but. they're not high fashion. That's you wouldn't. Well, yeah. you never know. You tie never know. tie London. your we, tie your wellie laces all the way up. There's have you ever seen the wellies that are painted to look yes. like gillies? Yes. Oh There's my a, gosh. They're, I'll, I'll put the picture up. They're but, uh, spectacularly horrible. Wow, they're really horrible. I love it. I love how horrible they are. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah. So yeah. So hopefully that. that helps. But yeah, there's not much. You don't actually add chemicals to kilt ever. Nope. You can add Teflon coating, but the mills generally do that. Um, yeah, and it's it's wool. Yeah, and I'd be adding things to a kilt. Let me let me go a step further. If you say forget those guys, they don't know what the hell they're talking about. I'm going to do it anyway. Great, go ahead. What I would all, what I would caution is use the under apron first, or use the inside of the under apron as a test. As a test. Okay. Yeah. Okay. You don't want to monkey up a five hundred dollar kilt with spray stuff that you use to go camping if it's going to affect the color of the kilt or if it's going to screw something up 
So use the under apron as a test. Mm -hmm. I agree. Done. Indeed. Mr. Mac. All right. <clears throat> so where did she go? Okay. So I we have Morgan. It's coming from the YouTubes or the Facebooks. Uh, this is coming from YouTube, I believe. I've been sure. making notes of that. I, I am personally, to me I'm personally honored okay. if there's people from the UK watching, by the way. I think that's, oh, yes. that's I really appreciate the fact we have an inter yeah. international audience and some folks from the old country, basically. Yeah, got I'm a... happy that anyone watches. It's, well, yeah, there's that we're, too. We're two guys know, just like... geeking out about kilts. It's true. So the that's fact true. that anyone watches us, my wife doesn't understand why. <laughs> I don't really understand <laughs> my, why. My wife doesn't but, know why either. But yeah, you know. it's fun, and it's yeah. I'm I'm just psyched that people like what we're doing, and especially psyched when it's in the UK and we have you know guys in or and ladies in Scotland watching what we're doing. It's mm -hmm. pretty awesome. Yeah. Sorry, Mac. Yeah, we just got a, a message from uh, Chris Woodland. He's watching in New Zealand, so <laughs> all over the world here. Nice. Kiwis, all right. Yep. Um, all right, so we have That's Morgan. Where a lot of the wool comes from. Yeah. That's true. That's Indeed. true. So we have Morgan asking. She's been watching, been watching for a while, little while. Would a beret work for for formal or only common wear? I wouldn't wear any hat for formal. Yeah. Um, definition of formal usually is linked to the time of day. And uh, if it's an evening event, which is when you'd be wearing the most formal gear, uh, hats are coming off anyway. You don't have a head cover indoors. And uh, if you're putting on a, a coatee, you know, like a Prince Charlie, and you're doing black tie or white tie, not usually wearing a hat. Yeah. So um, if it's a the height of formality, in my estimation, during the day might be a daytime wedding or uh, a clan gathering where you really want to put on your best stuff. And in that case, you're outdoors and you're dealing with tweeds, in which case um, a, uh, I'd probably go with a true Tam, uh, you know, Balmoral type, you know, Scottish bonnet kind of a thing or a Glengarry um, <clears throat> because that's the most bluffo traditional option. Um, I use a beret frequently um, as a casual uh, hat with my kilts. I like the look of it. Um, it's very similar to to a to a tam, um, or tam. Yeah, it's like a stripped down, yeah. miniaturized tam in some ways. Yep. But uh, but uh, really, in in strictly speaking, formal is kind of an indoor thing a lot of the time, and therefore the head coverings don't really apply. Yep. So yeah, yeah. yeah. It's the the uh, a beret, a tam, a Balmoral are all very very similar. It's kind of a, a floppily doppily mm -hmm. to use your is mm -hmm. it floppily floppily doppily floppily doppily floppily doppily. Yes, yeah, one of Eric's words or well. He stole mm -hmm. it from somewhere, but that's fine. Mm -hmm. It's Eric's. Uh, so a the floppily doppily hat just kind of like hangs down the side. It looks fine with a kilt in general, mm -hmm. um, but generally more casual outdoors, not inside the formal. Now I will say this, since it was a, a lady asking, though, um, if you're concerned with ladies' Highland dress, you can wear whatever you want on your head. Um, yeah, so Coraline's nodding a little bit here, but the uh, yeah, um, if you want to have a beret as part of your ensemble. Uh, for the big event, and you can make it work and look, you know, dashing with it, then that's fine. You don't have to pay attention to the, the head covering rules that gentlemen are usually expected to conform to. Would they? I, I can't. I can't picture in my in my mind any any pictures from the UK. Like I'm, I'm going to like formal stuff, like Kentucky Derby style hats, which is like the crazy big, you know, you know circus train running you around mean, the hats and all kinds of stuff you mean ascot that they wear no no, no no like the the hats that the women's wear the women wear hats in the uk much more than the u.s yes um in the u.s it's pretty much reserved for you know baseball cap casual or the kentucky derby so mm -hmm. i'm i'm kind of you know I'm, I'm drawing a parallel for people who don't know that end of it but i'm trying to think in my mind have i ever seen a picture of a woman in a kilted skirt or sash or anything like that with a elaborate hat putting it nicely not an elaborate hat no um when they are wearing hats it is still uh during the day it is still out of doors um and i've seen variations in old photography of both like balmoral slash bonnet hats or glengarry's but it's uh, and max nodding are you you think just traditional or military from your experience i think well that style hat was very popular in the 1860s so yep you see oh, yeah, a lot yeah. of women wearing, far back, but yeah. wearing in the 1860s mm -hmm. 1880s yeah. wearing that style hat so mm -hmm. i think it's just with highland wear, but, but that's, that's the question oh, no, yeah, yeah with, um, with, with women's interpretation <coughs> of highland wear yeah okay uh, the house of lebron i think they put a bunch of photos up recently uh now they were royalty but they had 
um, they're wearing kilted skirts and okay, such. Yeah. So, but yeah, they've um, they've been sharing a lot of photos of more uh, women of late on their okay. page. Yeah. But yeah, it's uh, and I I was imagining I'm remembering pictures of uh, women at gatherings in the 50s, like 40s and 50s and 60s. Some of those photos, and even then, it was still a popular thing to do. But but again, that's during the day. That's not you're Formal not going to wear evening. a hat at the yeah. ball. I, I would assume that none of those were evening. Yeah, they weren't like ball gowns or whatever. So. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, House of LeBron is a very uh, very cool uh, company with a very. Uh, very Steeped strong in history. Yeah, yeah, very strong investment in in showing the history. So if you want to just get some more eye candy, either look at Robert Hughes's pictures on the Kilts and Culture Facebook group, or go to House of LeBron or both. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Cool, Mr. Eric. We'll do another one of yours. Sure. Okay. Um. <laughs> do you want an easy one or a hard one? Any. Any. All right. I am an open book. Ryan K. asked us, can you discuss how American firefighters got into using the pipes and drums? Uh, and the, he, uh, he wants to, he makes a note of, you know, he knows, for instance, that the, uh, one of the first organized fire brigades originated in Scotland. I have some backup data on that, by the way, Ryan. Um, but how did uh, <coughs> fire departments become associated with uh, bagpipes? Yeah. Um, in early American history, during the... Uh, the, the Nina, Nina kind of period, the mm -hmm. no Irish need mm -hmm. to fly kind mm -hmm. of period. Um, the Irish were looking for work and they could generally get, you know, more dangerous work, um, you know, because they yeah. were expendable, so to speak. Um, and this is something I thought to, it sounded like it was true, but we actually researched a little bit and found out that we're right. It is true. Um, was that they, there was a lot of, you know, firemen and policemen who were Irish because it was a more dangerous job. Yeah. Um, when we designed our uh, law enforcement tartan and our uh, uh, firefighter memorial tartan, they included a green stripe for the Irish who, you know, had a, such a strong uh, start in that community, in the law enforcement and firefighter community. Uh, and it's it's true. We did a bunch of research on it, or some modern amount of research. Yeah. And it's uh, turns out it's true. That's kind of where it started, was it was a dangerous job. So the Irish were the ones who kind of stepped up and filled that gap and said, we're going to do it. So with that, and with you know being a dangerous job, there were funerals. Um, they kind of brought of the funerals. the bagpipes and and all of that to the funeral ceremony, to those processions, and from there it kind of went into the well, you were a firefighter, but maybe you're Italian or maybe you're you know whatever insert ethnicity here, and it didn't matter. You were a firefighter. That was your identity. That's how you want to be remembered. Yeah. So for your funeral. That was just what you did. So it kind of evolved that way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, essentially, they uh, funerals are always a big deal uh, for the Irish community, um, just like weddings, you know. But wakes. Uh, yeah, wakes and stuff. So they 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 were celebratory isn't quite the right word, but the point is you made a you made it a big deal because you wanted to honor the person who had passed away. Um, so they had pipes. They had Irish pipes, which of course are you know I always Illin pipes. Yeah. It's Illin pipes. Yeah. Is it Illin or Illin? Yes, send me, send, a, send me the pronunciation, guys. Um, but basically, Lucas would know. Yeah, they were they're more of an indoor instrument. They're a little quieter. So uh, Highland pipes, and great the march great with. pipes. <laughs> uh, Lucas can do it. But uh, great pipes were um, adopted probably because a lot of these memorial services and then parades connected to the services were being held out of doors, and you wanted to make a larger noise for the sake of the crowd and also, frankly, to impress the public because you wanted to call attention to the to the general public. Our guys are laying down their lives for you guys. You should probably pay attention. Um, I would personally suspect, and I didn't find a reference to this, but I suspect that probably the bagpipes became more popular at the same time that uh, Highland Pipes were being picked up by like the Gaelic Athletic Association, um, you know, the Gaelic League, and the, yeah. uh, and the Nationalists around the turn of the century. Um, and we know that Irish regiments by World War I were using bagpipes, and I suspect they kind of bled over at about the same time into... The firefighting tradition, I would guess, but I don't know. Um, they probably were using whatever people had on hand uh, up through most of the 19th century. But that's basically it. The, the one thing I found out which I thought was most interesting is that everybody thinks Amazing Grace is a traditional hymn it's for funerals. Not. It's become that, but it wasn't really on the scene until the 1970s when a, um, a group of Scots guards mm. touring the U.S., um, adopted the song to the bagpipes. 
So right. It's only, only nine notes. Yeah. Right. So Got it only it. goes back to the 1970s. <clears throat> okay. Yeah. Nice. But there you go. And now you know. Mm -hmm. And no one's half the battle. Mm -hmm. I think it's a it's a good thing to keep in mind this month with St. Patrick's Day, the firefighters yeah. and the police. No, I love I love interesting little tidbits like that where we think something is, you know, millions of years old. It's always been done this way, and it's only forty years old, fifty years old. Yeah, nice for that, for that song at least. Yeah, hmm. yeah, very nice, Mister Mac. All right, so we have William uh, asking, when wearing only a shirt and vest while kilted, must one wear a shortened vest? As with a jacket, or or could one wear a uh, regular woolen vest? <clears throat> regular woolen vest, as in like a V-neck sweater vest kind of thing. I think he means like a Saxon, like a Saxon wear, like a regular oh. vest. Go with both. Okay, sweater sure. vest. Do what you want. It's gonna rumple up, or you can fold it at the bottom hem if you want to to compensate for the length. Um, yeah, regular a, Saxon vest. For Saxon vest, it depends on how long it is. Um, a lot of them. And how long you are. Yes, the um, how tall you are and how long your torso is. Anyway. Right. Um, the yeah, it, the the problem with wearing a regular suit vest, Saxon wear like you would wear with a pair of pants, with a kilt, is that the kilt is worn much higher. So the top of the kilt should be about two inches above your belly button, and then your sporin is basically about uh, well, figure you know three four inches below the belt, so three inches on the belt, so seven inches down from the top of the kilt. Rough math. Um, now, if you're wearing a regular suit vest, it's going to generally cover the top of the sporin, and it kind of looks, it looks like you're wearing your daddy's suit vest. It doesn't look like it was designed to go with the suit, or with the sporin, with the kilt, and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So, generally, if it is a shorter vest, that's fine. If you can get it in a, if, if it's a, uh, you're going to Joseph A. Banks, you walk in the door, you see a tweed vest you fall in love with the tweed matches your isle sky carton perfectly you have to have it you talk to the wife you convince her you need this vest this is the one um go over and if it comes in short regular long let's say you're a guy who's six foot tall get the short or get the regular make sure it comes a little bit it's a little bit short on you it may not quite meet the top of your pants but that's the point because your vest or excuse me your kilt is worn higher and you wear your pants. So you want to make sure it looks good with the kilt. Right. If you already own a vest and you want to know if that one is going to go with the kilt, put it on, go in front of a mirror. Is it hanging over top of the sporn? If it is, what's going to end up happening is as you're standing there, you're going to keep wanting to tuck, if you want to you know, look tidy, you're going to be tucking the vest behind the sporn. And it's going to be a bit of a pain in the butt. So your mileage may vary. It depends on what you want to do, how much you want to kind of fix yourself as you're wearing the outfit. Yeah. If you're wearing a sweater vest, again, if you're a taller guy, or if even if you're not a taller guy, if you're a regular size guy, um, you want to make sure it's a little bit shorter, or if you're a short guy, it might not work quite as well, um, just because it's going to be covering up the sporin, and you're going to constantly be tucking it behind the sporin for it to look even close to good. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, pretty much. Um, if you're going really, really casual, like no tie, and you're just keeping the vest open, a lot of people will not notice that there's a disproportion That's going a fair on. Point. Um, I can get away with it personally a little because I have a long torso. I have Norwegian ancestry. We're built for rowing boats. So basically, I can get away with it a little bit, but <clears throat> I won't use a Saxon vest if I want to look crisp and right on. Um, and definitely, I've had occasions where it's just like the vest is... You know, like you said, the the, the, the points of the, on the vest are bumping into the sporn. It's just like, yeah, this is no good. Um, so you abandon that. But, you know, if you got a vest from Goodwill, you're just getting starting out in this stuff, and that's what you got. Yeah. You can make it work. It's more, much more forgivable than a jacket, which is what we always say. Do not try to yeah. wear a regular Saxon suit jacket with a kilt. That's a really bad faux pas. It, it's... And the jacket's a faux pas because it, it's too long. It's going to end up covering... you can't cheat it. You can't fix it the way yeah. you can a, a, a vest. So. Yeah. It's going to be easily. It's going to be covering up at least the top half of the back of your kilt, if not the top two-thirds. Yeah. So you only end up with about eight inches of pleats showing at the bottom. And at that point, it just looks mismatched, mispaired, just odd. Right. So, yeah. Vest. See what you can do. Try to make it work. If it works, great. Good on you. If it doesn't, Save up a couple bucks over time, get the proper vest, you know, and 
It'll yeah. fit better. Just be honest with yourself when you look in the mirror. Yeah. And it's also, it boils down to budget and, you know, it always, how much you want to spend yeah, on this. Yeah, it depends on where you are in this and how much money you got to spend on it. So. Yep, agreed. Mr. Mac. All righty, so we have John uh, Smith asking, any information on flashes and where they came from? Uh, also, he just bought his first kilt at 19, <coughs> and he loves cool. it and is definitely getting more. But he's uh, questioning about In flashes. 2019. Oh, 2019, yeah. okay. I thought he was saying he was 19 years old. I was like, well, he bought nice. his first kilt at 19. So At 19. So that's he's cool. 19 that's awesome. Old. Congratulations. Or was 19 when he bought the kilt. He might be yes. 60 now. But, See, yeah. if I would have known that and the, the the reaction from women that the kilt brings, I would have done it at 19. Too. Yeah, yeah. Smart move. Good anyway, man. so flashes. Yes. Yeah, flashes. Um, I'm 90 percent positive. This is kind of one of those common sense things. Just kind of makes sense. Um, flashes came from garter ties and tying something around your leg. So right. think of it this way. Just use ropes. Forget everything. Just think in your head of a rope. You know. You have a pair of hose or long socks that don't stretch. This is before elastic. You pull it all the way up. As you're walking around, they will fall down throughout the day. So you pull up the socks or the hose, um, and you'll need a way to affix it to your leg, make sure it stays up throughout the day. Uh -huh. So you have effectively a knitted garter tie, or think of like, again, like a, kind of like a rope that you would tie around the leg and then a half knot and kind of let the ends dangle down and then fold down the top of the hose over top of the garter ties. Um, that's how it started. And then it kind of evolved into either torn bits of tartan or, you know, little uh, flags sewn onto elastic band that it became an, a, an adjustable elastic band that we have today. So that's where it came from. And it just kind of evolves over time. A lot of this stuff mm -hmm. starts out of necessity. Necessity is the mother of invention. And it starts there. And then eventually somebody goes, hey, that's a good idea. My socks fall down too. I'm going to do the same thing. And then that guy does it. And then more people see it and they start doing it. And then it just goes from there. Yeah. So it's a it's a practical necessity uh, that has become a bit of flair at the same time. Um, I'd be willing to bet that you could find, I haven't seen them myself, but if anybody out there has, um, that there's probably some flashes of a military sort that might have had either uh, canvas um, or leather strap for the garter and then the flash oh. the flash you know before elastic i mean elastic yeah. is actually pretty old um so technologically i think we're probably thinking what like 120 years i mean turn of the century i think elastic started to yeah come in would you think the like i don't know like rev war period like you have the leather garters then exactly so it would just keep it would just continue stemming from mm -hmm. that type of thing mm -hmm. and i'd be willing to bet that there was a time where um there may have been groups or the military who didn't worry about the flash what we call the flash, the decorative part. But then it became, you know, well, the civilian ties with the floppily doppily, but you got flash color there. Let's have some decoration on our uniform, but we need to make it uniform and easy to maintain so it looks the same on every single guy. So the the ribbons became... I'm willing to bet the flash ribbons were invented by the military. But I've never looked into it that okay. closely to be yeah, a lot absolutely of the, sure. But a lot of the Highland wear tradition comes out of the military easily, in general. I'd say easily like 80% of it does, but yeah. yeah. So there you go. I mean, you can you can still get garter ties. Uh, you can still make your own garter ties. You can play around with that kind of thing if you want. But um, but flashes are basically a what's at the very least say a 20th century uh, invention to streamline and make efficient the device that holds up your socks. And if I will draw this parallel, hmm. if a kilt pin is jewelry for your kilt, yeah, flashes are jewelry for your socks. Yeah. Unless you have other jewelry on your legs, but that's your business. It's true. Or tattoos. Yeah. Cool. I like tattoos. Me too. Mr. Eric. Have you ever seen a tattoo yours? of flashes? I've seen a there? tattoo of skin dudes. Yeah, I've seen that one. That can be actually kind of cool. Yeah. Um, <laughs> follow, let me give you a follow-up real quick. Um, CG Johnson 61 asked us, um, this is from YouTube, uh, do the flashes have to match the kilt? Uh, I have two clans in the family and wanted to represent both. So I think he's thinking of trying to use one tartan on the flashes for the one clan and then the kilt be the tartan of the other clan. I would I would answer that this way. Do, do the flashes have to match the kilt? Um, it's not typically done. That doesn't mean you can't do it, but it's not typically done. Um, generally, it's when you wear Highland wear whether you're wearing clan crest items, whether you're wearing tartan, 
it's you're wearing you're representing a clan traditionally speaking you're representing one clan so you would wear the flashes of the same tartan as the kilt you would wear the clan crest items whether that's kilt pin buckle whatever it is of the tartan that you're wearing so if i'm wearing a campbell kilt i'd be wearing campbell clan crest items steward kilt steward clan crest items so generally no you wear the same thing um is anyone going to you know shoot you for wearing it no i will <clears throat> i'm trying to be I think funny. you're threatening our audience i'm trying to be funny but i just made the mistake of drinking some more of that whiskey and it totally went the wrong way <laughs> live television folks <clears throat> i think that's what happens sometimes is that um <clears throat> a person will get a kilt and they have the two clans for instance and they want to represent the other clan but they don't have the money for the other kilt so they're or they just want to do it at the same time it's i want yeah, to represent it, all yeah, the heritage it, all yeah the time. doing it at the same time is one thing and and trying to do it in an economical way i think might be a factor for some people i've seen this in the store i've seen i've seen people in the store try to do this um I really don't recommend it. Um, I just it just feels like it's crossing the streams a little too much for me, at least. Yeah. Um, now, if it's very very subtle, you might get away with it. Nobody would know. But um, I'd rather find some other way to represent both, or just take turns, give each clan its own day, yep. so to speak. You know, so that uh, you know your attention is more focused on them, which could be an interesting thought exercise too. Yeah. It's. You know? Yeah. It's. It the, the the Scottish way to phrase this or, or the mindset of it is by wearing both you're doing disservice to both you're not honoring either you're dishonoring them to a small degree at least yeah short um, shrift maybe yeah you're you're shortchanging both of them simultaneously hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah I can it's, see that. you do one and that's the one you do for that day if you want to do your mom's the next day then you wear hers with all the you know all the clan items for that one all the tartan items for that one yeah yeah i agree done all right is it max turn or my turn <clears throat> think um me. mac all right so we have uh one of our twitch viewers oh Woo! cool hey so, yes the few the proud um, the twitchy. one of or the one <laughs> one of we have one more of, than one person. Oh, yeah. Three. Right. Yes, we they're are all, killing it. We're all in the same room having a watch party. <laughs> you're having a nice, you this know, awesome. you're playing Magic the Gathering. You just got the speed on while they're playing. Oh, this is cool. All right. Go ahead. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. We're not actually trying to insult Twitch. I'm just impressed. No, people Twitch is Twitch awesome. Dig this stuff, too. Yeah. So we uh, he's noticed something behind Eric on the wall. Uh, he, he wanted to know uh, which Tartans were those. And uh, he get a little, little blip about Because he asked me about the sure. one that I'm blocking specifically no i just for what okay. which tartans what were those they? behind them because yeah. we, we had a bet on that the one people would ask about would be the <clears> one <throat> that you can't see because of my head yeah but um those are tartans that uh some of the original tartans that we designed um <laughs> we have that was a mistake it just blinded everybody <laughs> okay. um we have uh the far the one closest to the uh, uh the bookshelves is the german american tartan mm -hmm. Next, we have the Mary Queen of Scots, which is actually a pink tartan. It's one of the ones my wife did. Then we have the Firefighter Memorial tartan. We have the American Heritage tartan. And then the one I believe is out of camera shot, we have the German Heritage tartan. Right. So when we when we do this, 2007? 2007. 2007 that all yeah. the, I mean, you've registered a lot of tartans, but those in particular were from 2007. Now, that's probably why you got them framed. Yeah, because at the we time did it all like, at the same time. We're yeah, like, so yes, like we did these special, tartans. We need to show it off in the shop. And then we did a bunch more. And we're like, yeah, framing stuff is really expensive. And we'd rather, <laughs> you know, eat than frame right, things. Right. Um, but yeah, we've done probably 100 or so tartans total. Um, that includes the state seals, right? Yeah, yeah. That yeah, includes okay. all state seals. Um, but yeah, we have a lot of tartans under our belt, so to speak. Um, but yeah, those are the, those are the OGs. Um, some of the original five, six, seven, eight of them that we did, and I think they're honestly they're some of the coolest in a sense. I mean, they have they have a lot of a lot of gravitas, in my opinion. I I, I I'd like to see a uh, law enforcement memorial on the wall someday. Yeah, but that because that's the other I one. I just that, don't want to pay but... for the frame. <laughs> we'll chip um, in. We'll, we'll get, no, but it's happen. the one thing that I'm I will say that I am proud of because I've done I've done a lot of things over the. 18 year whatever how long long we've been in business 
I've done a lot of things over the 18 years that I look back, like at our original website design and things like that, and I look at it and go, oh my God, that is horrible. What was I thinking? The original kilt that I did, those kind of things. Mm -hmm. No, we're not taking a picture of it. The original show that we did. Yes, the original show The very show first that we episode did. of this show. Don't Google that. Please don't. Oh my um, God. You will think so much less of us. No, anyway. go for it. Go for it. Um, yeah, but it's when I look at those designs, they're still good designs. I'm very, very yeah. pleased in hindsight that mm -hmm. we took the time to like really think it through and not just rush it through and quickly register a bunch of them but yeah. we, we we thought about it a lot and mm -hmm. kind of came up with some good designs i'm still pretty pleased with them yeah cool hence them being on the wall indeed thanks for noticing yes see that's why we have the different angles fun stuff yeah yeah on this wall you'll see a light socket <laughs> and some sound insulation yes mm -hmm. <clears throat> all right mr mac next question all right so we have bruce no, we're gonna go. To, well, yeah, we'll do Bruce's question first. Good night, Bruce. There's a Bruce few. Is like, yes, no. There's a few we can go back and forth here. Um, so where did I lost here. Where's Bruce? There. On another issue. Sorry, Bruce. Uh, Come back to us, Bruce. <laughs> at Bruce. many burn suppers, he sees men with fluffy white dicky type flair, with the the shirt. The, the, uh, oh, the oh, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. What are they called? And do we, and uh, is there <clears throat> sources out there for them? They're called the jabot. So the jabot usually goes with lace matching cuffs if they're doing it right. Indeed, which is very fun to dip in your soup. Um, <laughs> there, there are sources for them. Not many. Um, it's basically they they kind of either they're I don't know. They, they used to be from shirts. It was attached to the shirt. Correct. It was just the cuff of the shirt. Correct. And then nobody sells that kind of shirt because they're horrible. So they ended up just basically making little bracelets that kind of elast or elastic around your wrist and yeah. kind of stick out from the cuff of your your yeah. jacket yeah um same thing with the jabot around the neck it's just a froofy frilly lacy thing that comes down the front um it is like the niche of a niche of a niche type of market um there's not many that. people doing them. you say that but can we get them there was like there was like two sources for them in okay. the UK, okay. and one of which stopped making them. So okay. maybe we can get them. Okay. Well, let me let me in that in that case let me uh, let me give you the the hack DIY. You can find the same kind of thing if you look for, and this is horribly lowballing it, but you can find like pirate costume parts on like Amazon with a I because I have one. All um, right, mate, it's give me your finest. Scotch. Yeah, it's 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 a it's the the lace neckerchief looking thing, and it's got the it's got a strap with a bit of Velcro. Uh, one size fits all, and then you have the elasticized uh, wrist cuff things to get the same effect. If you are crafty, you could get one of those and then build one that looks a lot better by adding more layers of the lace. Um, it's possible that there are patterns online. Um, it's possible that there's historical shirts and stuff you could consider if you really want to go for broke and do it super proper. Um, it's a niche of a niche, but in some ways I think it's coming back a little bit because... Um, as I've noted before, I feel like the retro looks are definitely on the upswing. I think people are wanting to do something a little more different. And so some of these more exotic, more traditional looks are coming back. So the fact that he's seeing it at Burn Suppers tells me that I'm yeah, correct. It's so, uh, And that's where you would see it. You would see it at a formal event. Yeah. Um, and it's when you want to be the King Peacock in a room of peacocks. Um, and on top of that, it's the everyone wants to feel special. Everyone wants to be the special snowflake and have their, mm -hmm. their, their coolest better than anybody nobody else has this kind of outfit um that's kind of where it comes from to a degree i'm, I'm getting psychological on it mm -hmm. um but it is you're right it is a historical outfit there's also the the downton abbey effect as we would call it yep as we now it's before. pre downton abbey time period see now it's going to be the emma effect everybody's going to do all regency <laughs> stuff what's emma what's emma it's a book by jane austen there's a movie out right now okay the Emma so, effect. The, the, the Regency that. thing is going to come back. I was just testing him. Yep. Um, Again. <laughs> but yeah, it's it's one of those things where it kind of goes in cycles and it come it becomes cool because yeah. no one's doing it. Then everyone does it. Then it's not cool. So people stop doing it. And then 20, 30 years later, everyone wants to, or a couple people want to do it. And then they start it again. Yeah. Um, so it's, yeah, it's something old, historical, and it's it's the, the cool throwback thing. Yeah. So basically, it's basically, um, it's a it's a Highland survival a formal dress which was around for a long time um we tend to hold on to things a lot longer than other parts of the world do when it comes to customs and fashion looks and uh 
it's basically a throwback to an 18th uh, early 19th century cravat um, and and the decorative shirts of that of that period so if you think like uh, vampire Lestat Tom Cruise the scene of him picking his lace on his cuffs that's yeah. yep, yep, that's yep. the same time era look um, as a standard formal thing it's not as antiquated as you might think one of my one of the funniest images out there online for me is a, a screen cap from uh, on Her Majesty's Secret Service, which is a 1960s James Bond film where he's in formal Highland attire and he's wearing the jabot and a Montrose doublet and everything. So even in the 1960s, that was still considered the most formal of formal Highland wear. Yeah, because it, it hangs in Highland wear specifically. We just hang it hang hangs on to it, it like forever. grim death. Yes, know, so you're very, very conservative the, in that way. And at the same time, we push the fashion forward. Yeah, we got we we go both ways, which is awesome. So, indeed, yeah, it's it's it all it's all cyclical. It's like it's like jams in the nineteen eighties. <laughs> I'm just giving you the uh, opportunity to use that that the, image the of image you in the again. jams again. Yes, me in the jams. Sure, sure no problem. Best <laughs> best mm -hmm. image mm -hmm. ever. Absolutely love it. So yeah, if you want to do it, you could rock it, but it's really technically very highly formal. Yeah, yeah. Cool, so. Mr. Eric. Let's do another. Absolutely, I kind of shaggy dog there. So, okay. Um, I have one I'm saving till later in the show that I want to do um, uh, concerning hats. So I'll dun, that later. dun, dun, dun. <clears throat> but more recent question we had in came in from uh, Barbara McFarlane Allen. Uh, this topic of kilts on women. Uh, she herself is not a skilt wearer, a, a, a skirt wearer normally. Um, but, uh, and she doesn't know if she'd want to invest in a kilt. Uh, but she does like wearing her clan tartan. Is it okay for a woman to wear a <clears throat> kilt, a tartan kilt? Um, where does it tip the balance of being a good ambassador, thank you for using our phrase, uh, versus being an ugly American as a woman wearing, I'm assuming she means a man's kilt? Right. Is that too <clears throat> fashion forward or is that cool or is there precedent for it? Um, with a lot of this stuff, it's just personal preference to a degree. And the other side of it is, women are going to do what women are going to do with fashion. There's there's a lot more restrictions on men's fashion than there are on women's fashion. Women women break a lot more rules than men do. Um, traditionally speaking, using my... Uh, uh, air quotes. Air quotes. My ever-present air quotes. I apologize for that. Um, the men wear the kilt to the knee. Women wear the kilt above the knee or below the knee. That being said, women bagpipers will wear the kilt to the knee. Um, if it's... Uh, if women feel odd wearing mini skirts or things above the knee, but they don't want to be matronly and have it like, you know, mid calf or ankle length, that kind of thing. They just kind of wear it whatever length up and down the leg scale um, mm -hmm. they want to wear it. So it does look more masculine as I've started wearing kilts, you know, for the 20 years, whatever I've been wearing them. I can now kind of, I've developed a sense of what feels more masculine or feels more feminine within the whole thing. So wearing a kilt to the knee feels more masculine than wearing it above the knee. And I'm not talking, you know, micro mini, you know, obscene short. I mean, like two or three inches above the knee is still feminine versus, you know, middle of the knee or very top of the knee, which is a little bit more masculine. Is that a fair point? Uh, it's certainly the conventional point. Is basically a con the, yeah, that that's, the I'm coming from a from a traditional yeah. angle. So I've seen we've had several uh, ladies who are customers who've uh, gotten uh, men's style kilts custom made um, for uh, things like weddings. So if you want to have a more uh, unisex or androgynous or masculine look, that's cool. That's definitely still an American thing. I think um, you talk about being a, an ugly American ambassador. I wouldn't really do it if I were going over to Scotland for vacation yeah. or something yeah um stateside you know we we're much more flexible with this kind of thing um and i've definitely we've definitely had several customers who do it usually for a special occasion because the cost involved as you pointed out barbara um but uh yeah i mean like like you said i mean women's fashion varies crazily uh <clears throat> and is more volatile and uh you can play with it more you have more flexibility yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, we definitely, there, there is a precedent, it's a small precedent, but there's a precedent for women doing it just because they like the look for whatever reason. And I've definitely had women who are on the groom's side in a wedding, for instance, you know, they're part of the wedding yeah. party. So they want, they want the same outfit as everybody else. So, um, yeah. so you can do it. And the other thing I'd say is 
it's when when I'm explaining it or talking about things, I'm I'm explaining the the rules or conventions. It's not sure. really that yeah. you you are not allowed to or you're allowed to. It's this is how it's typically done. It's also done other ways. Ultimately, that's why I started out with it's personal preference. It's where do you land on it? You're the one wearing it out in public. You're the one who's going to have people coming up to you and asking you questions about your heritage or talking to you about the killer or that kind of stuff. So how much do you want to engage or open yourself up to a potential comment of why are you wearing a man's kilt? Ultimately, I don't think a lot of people would ask you, why are you wearing a man's kilt? So it's not yeah. that big of a deal. Yeah. Some people might if they're like uber kilt traditionalists, but it's it's going to be a You probably don't want to hang out with them. Well, if, if you're you might want to hang out with them, but it's... She's asking an honest question. I'm just giving an honest. Sure, sure. Here's here's the scale. It's not our job to pass judgment. We are not here to tell people what you're allowed to do or not allowed to do. It's our job, or the way I see it, is it's our job to kind of interpret how it's done, what the conventions are, what the traditional angle is, and then leave it on the table for you guys to decide what you want to do, what you're comfortable doing. Because ultimately, when you're out at the Highland Games, the grocery store, wherever you go, we're not there with you. You're the ones wearing it, Very so much. you have to be comfortable doing it. I'll say, I'll say this: if you're worried about being a, an ugly American, um, but you still want to be you, you still want to do your thing and express yourself, um, we like to say it comes down to being a sincere student of the culture. If you decide to be fashion forward or or non-conventional with your look, then think in terms of other ways that you can demonstrate or at least internalize the fact that you have a passion for the roots of this stuff. That basically there are other ways you can discuss things, you can be knowledgeable of things, you can present things uh, that come up in conversation, uh, which really prove that you have taken ownership. So that's, I think, being a, I love the term, I picked it up years ago, but being a sincere student of the culture is really what it's all about. Yeah. So. And the other thing I would give as, as a bit of practical advice, if you're concerned and if you want to kind of hedge your bets, maybe you just do two inches, two and a half inches above the knee. You don't go mini kilt, but you don't go full man's kilt. You go, you split the difference. Mm -hmm. That may be a way to do it if the, the reason she may be asking is maybe she's not comfortable with the look of her legs or she feels a little bit insecure about certain things. Maybe. So I'm just trying to kind of get into her head a little bit and figure a way to, Don't know. to keep it a little bit more on the feminine traditionalist side, but give her a little bit more length in it. I don't know. Or it could be her family tartan is not available in 11 ounce wool which is what most of the women's stuff is made out of. So maybe she's thinking about a man's kilt because she's, it's the only way she can find her tartan because it's only 13 or 16 ounce wool. Well, she there's, a lot of there's a lot of variables in this. Yeah. So. yeah, yeah. All right, shaggy dogging. You do you. Right. Done. We can just cut the whole front half of that answer off. You do you. <laughs> yep. Okay. It's going to be very short snippets. Mm -hmm. All right, Mr. Mac. All right, so we have we've been having two debates going back and forth uh -oh. on the uh, uh -oh, done, between done, YouTube sparked and, debates. and Facebook. It's actually it's been interesting watching the uh, conversations go back and forth. Okay, that's cool. Um, so we'll go to the first one. I the hope first it's cool. one is how What's how the and, social media and where did the uh, service tartans come about? Hmm. Okay. That's a good question. That's the first one, Just and that's being that's being debated. Okay. It, it's it's being debated <clears throat> on, on service tartans, as in. These are military... Military service. Military service tartans. Um, I believe... Now you're making... You put me on the spot. I, I believe... I want to say... Was was the Coast Guard first, Mac? Do you, I, do you I remember any of this? Well, the, the, Coast, the Coast Guard is, is based the only on one Hamilton. That's, it's based on Hamilton as so, the father of the Coast Guard. Yeah. Alexander Hamilton. Mm -hmm. um, and it is it basically... It's a very, very minor alteration of Hamilton. It's basically the Hamilton tartan with a wide, white stripe. That's it. Um... It's worn by the Coast Guard Auxiliary Pipe Band, um, and I'm 99% positive it is the only one that's officially recognized as a thing by the branch of the military. Mm. All the other ones are unofficial. Really? Okay. Yes. Even that's all? Yes. Huh. Okay. Because um, it's not part of the uniform. It's not in the uniform code. Okay. The I okay. want to say the last one to be registered was the Army, I think. Um I forget. Mm. Basically, they came about because somebody said, "Hey, I want a tartan. Let's design a tartan for the, you know, for uh, the Marine Corps." And then, boom, designed it. Leather neck tartan born. Hey, Marines have a tartan. Air Force should have a tartan. Okay, let's design the U.S. Air Force tartan. Boom, 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 boom. And it just kind of, you know, was downhill it, so, like that. But you think it was individual 
uh, veterans or people involved with the military who decide to try and get designed or design it themselves or agitate for it because Correct. they wanted to have it. Yes. So it was, a, it was a personal mission that became popular and then it took off. Yes. As opposed and to like a branch saying, assign Corporal so-and-so to design a tartan and get no, it registered. It, okay. Not that at all. It is, it is wholly owned by either the veterans or company. Again, I'm not quite sure which, and it may be different for different branches. I think they, yeah, they probably each have a slightly different story. <clears throat> Correct, but, but it was not sanctioned by the U.S. government or anything like that. It was the members of that branch wanting to have a tartan for their branch, possibly members of SAMS, the Scottish American Military Society. Yeah. Again, don't know, just conjecture. Um, and then they just registered it, had it woven. Um, Strathmore is the only mill that weaves all the different branches and holds them as stock supported. I think one other mill may weave the one or two of them mm. kind of randomly. But Strathmore actually weaves it. They're the place where 99% of the people get the cloth from. 13-ounce cloth. Good stuff. Um, and, yeah, that's about it. It's nothing It's nothing yeah, see, magical I, or mystical. It's yeah, just people wanted um, it to exist, so they made it exist. I think, I think it's, it's, it's kind of worth saying that they're not necessarily old, I think, is part of it. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think of the, the Army Tartan. And I'm sure there's other opinions out there, and maybe some people got some their fingers on some data. But let me give you my speculation was that the the army tartan the colors in it remind me of army uh recruitment effort artwork from when i was a kid from the 80s those were the colors that you saw everywhere for anything that was okay. related to recruitment for the army and i would have guessed that somebody in the marine corps said hey that's cool let's put some colors from the marine dress uniform into that to soup it up and turn it into our our thing yeah you know so the one <clears throat> built on the other and then the navy and stuff came in but I want to know when Edsel was designed. I'm sure we, it was could, the Edsel, we could look it up. Edsel it the, is named after the base. Yes, it was the base in Scotland. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure if it was Navy guys in Scotland at the Edsel base who did it, um, or if it was Scottish people, or how it kind of came to be. I feel like it, it was people who were vets who had served at that base and had yeah. fond memories of it, but I'm not sure. And I know that uh, the Polaris Tartan was, uh, it's, Polaris. was actually yep. a submarine. Yep. Um, and it was for uh, all submariners. Yep. Mac, you look like you're reading something. The In 2002 is when the Coast Guard Tartan was designed. Okay, then okay. I was completely wrong on that. Strike that from the record. But I'm not surprised if they base it on Hamilton. I mean, yeah, no, they did. The reason, that the is reason, 100%. Yeah, and yeah, that, that, that yeah. makes perfect sense. If yeah. I were them, I would have done the same thing. So, um, And to Eric's point, the Army is based off of Army the, uh, off their um, so. their uniform colors. Yep. Yeah, so. I thought so. Do we know what's what's the oldest one? Did you figure that out or that's, no? That's um, okay. Right, so just not that I would ever put Mac on the here. spot and make him do. Um, well, we have a we have a lot of guys who are real quick. We have a lot of vets, and I'm curious if anybody has any other branch specific information that you've come across. I mean, we yeah, can check and we can check the registry and things like that too. Yeah, we can that's dig um, into this. Um, I'm curious. Heading to now. Um, but yeah, we've got a we've got quite a few people, and so far everything's been in lining up with everything that we're seeing, um, as we're seeing as we're researching as well. <laughs> okay, okay, good. So, <laughs> It's um, almost like we know stuff. Or make very good educated <laughs> guesses. Yes. Well, there's that, too. Yeah. As long as we're honest about it. Yeah. We're fine. But, yeah, anytime um, when we, you know, here's the asterisk. Anytime where we aren't sure of something, we're going to hedge it and basically say, like, I think this is true. I'm 90% positive. Don't quote me on this. Those kind of things. Because we are fallible just like anybody else. And we're answering questions live when we answer these things. So we're trying to go from memory on all this stuff. And then if we're wrong, yeah. we look it up afterwards and we'll either put a little, little line. Well, that's why I something. like doing the shows because it reminds me of things I was curious about myself. Yeah, that's so true. It's like, oh yeah, I wanted to read about that. So I like doing the show because it puts us on the spot and makes us think fast. Exactly. Well, yeah, exactly. It's you got to know your stuff to be able to do this. All right, I'm going to try again. Let's smell it. it. smells better. Okay. Actually, yeah. Mr. Mack, let's do the next question. The, I think that answers for the yeah. most part ish. The, yeah. the other debate that was going on cool. was um, mm -hmm. dress shirts. For formal occasions or non-formal occasions, pockets or no pockets? No, no pockets. No pockets, on a and generally, if it's formal, you're either wearing a like a, a doublet or a a, a coatie with a vest. So for the most part, you're going to be covering up the pocket anyway, so it doesn't matter. Yeah. Um, now, uh, strictly speaking, for Highland dress, formal with the wing collar. Uh, shirt we tend to advise and I think it's still standard over there um, dress shirts or wing collar shirts that have a placket rather than requiring oh, studs 
uh, like a tuxedo shirt does. Um, if you can't get one of those, then default to using the one with the studs, but maybe go with like a pearlescent stud or something so it doesn't show up. The point being that all the attention is going to the sporin in the outfit. You don't want to have all this extra bling up here. Um, Javos kind of... Nah, I guess Javos don't... Up. Yeah, Javos don't really fly in the face of that advice, I don't think. But No, because they would cover up all the stuff. Um, I was just saying about like, like is Jabot distracting from the sporin, but I don't but it's not. Um, so yeah, I mean, and a regular dress shirt for a... Um, uh, if you're just using a, a regular uh, dress shirt, uh, like an Oxford collar shirt, um, yeah, don't don't go with a pocket. Um, I don't know why you would want it. Um, it's going to add a, a tiny bit of little bulk here on your chest, um, and I don't think it's very graceful looking to have objects in a chest pocket. A, it's going to cause a lump, like if you're keeping pens or something in there, um, then you're like digging in there to get your pens out. It's just it's not something you do in a formal setting. Um, you got a sporin. Carry your pens and your cards and that. Um, yeah, I would avoid the chest pocket. Man doesn't like pockets. I don't. Well, not on shirts. Not not for that <clears throat> context. Not for that context. I have See, lots um, of pockets on lots of shirts, but I like pockets on shirts. But for formal, it sure, would either be formal. it would either be covered up or yeah, or and you'd have an inside pocket on your jacket. Yeah. So you can keep or your cell phone even. in there, your pens in there, whatever you need. Yeah. Um. So yeah, it's it's unnecessary. It's not needed. I'd say that it's probably part of people are more apt to use dress shirts with pockets on them now because their formal is sometimes just nicer than normal yeah. in the American context. So you're maybe just wearing a vest. It's better than jeans. And that, and that some people consider to be dress up and formal and therefore you might still want the pocket there because you're used to carrying stuff in the pocket, something like that. Yeah, but, the whole the whole definition and understanding of formal, semi-formal, you know, dress casual whatever um it's very very much blurred um, especially at this the, point, these especially days yeah. in the u.s yeah. yeah it's as as society as a whole gets much more casual what we are defining as formal you know smart day wear those kind mm -hmm. of things it's it's very yeah fuzzy and even uh but a lot of higher end dress shirts meant to go with suits will not have a chest pocket um like our the charles to it to it to it to it to it um Charles Turret. He's your Lewin. Yeah. Yeah. He'll be Lewin. Yeah. Um, it's a really nice shirt company from the UK, and uh, their shirts do not have chest pockets. So, there you go. I like chest pockets. Yeah, but I can live without them. Got a good I just get it because I'm lazy. I run around the shop, and I don't have my sporn on, so then I need somewhere to put my phone, so I can carry my phone and cell phone around, because God knows that Kelly will call me when it's up in the shop, or up in my office, and I'm running around the store. Well, yeah, you should answer your phone. We'll get you, we need a, a bandolier, you know, or, or something. You know, a formal bandolier. Yes, yeah, formal bandolier. Yes. Or a holster, you know. Quick draw your phone. All right, sorry. <laughs> Horrible. No. Mac? Or is it my turn? It's your turn. It's my turn. Okay. Yes. All right. Uh, I'm going to go to the hat question then. All right. Uh, the hat question. This is a YouTube handle, so S G O oh, S Gerlock. 06294 I don't know if this is zip code or a serial number um, saying as a bald fella in the deep south I need a full brim hat in the summer but you guys have commented that specifically cowboy hats do not go with a kilt the flat caps and bonnets that I've seen seem to be made of a very hot material you know, he's talking about the wool um, and they don't have a full brim for coverage in the summer sun do you have any recommendations? and uh <coughs> I think I know how we're going to land on this. Um, to but I, I sympathize, Mr. Gerlock. I yes. totally, totally sympathize, especially as in the summer. someone who's had his scalp sunburned more than once. Mm -hmm. Good God, that's painful. If, yep. if, if you have hair, just, you don't know. You don't know. You don't know, like, man. Like it's, it's you don't know what it's like. Almost on the level with childbirth. It's it's horrible. <laughs> that's going a little far, but okay. Yeah, I know. On purpose. Um. I might get pushed back on that one. <laughs> okay, maybe not chopper. The, no, it's, yes, you got to wear a hat in the summer when you have chrome dome. Um, the, ultimately, form follows function. Wear what you need to wear to protect your head and your neck. Yeah, and don't get skin cancer. Stuff. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah, the whole skin cancer thing, that's probably bad, too. Um, no, when I'm out at the pool or running around, if I have a kilt on, in the summer, I wear one of the, like, floppy, boonie-style hat. So it just covers, you know, a brim that's probably two and a half, three inches wide. 
um, all the way yep. around. It's, and I just don't care. It's, I'm going to look how I'm going to look for that. I need to protect my head. I don't want to get sunburned. That matters more to me than what Johnny Pants 85 thinks as I'm walking into a grocery store on the way to the pool. But that's with a kilt. Yes. Okay. If I'm wearing a kilt. That's, that's the main, I mean, if obviously if you're wearing jeans. Yeah, if you're wearing jeans, matter. it doesn't matter. So, so yeah, practical, the, the, the bottom line, first of all, is practicality wins out. Take care of yourself. Be healthy. Doesn't um, look good. It's not like, yes, well, that looks wonderful. Well, but I, it's I, thought we, I thought we could test that. Um, yeah. The, the baseline recommendation I will give before I get into this is um, a linen flat cap might be a good option. It won't give you protection on the back of your head, back of your yeah. neck, rather. But, but there are linen flat caps, which look pretty decent with a kilt. We always tend to default to the fact that anything with a simpler silhouette and shorter brim or no brim is going to look better with a kilt just because of the silhouette of your body when you're wearing a kilt. But for full disclosure, I'm going to show you a couple of hats, including the one I wear in Arizona or Southern California or anytime I'm out hiking. So you ready for this? I'm scared. Oh, you should be. Mac, hold me. Right? I'm scared. Ready? Boom. Check this out. Check this action. Okay. That is that is a much... That, but, that, that's something. That's now, a stingier I'll, brim than the one that I wear. It's similar shape to it, but mine's, stingy? the whole thing is like floppy. This is a Barma, by the way. Okay. And I've had this thing for at least like 12 years. This thing is this thing has seen some stuff. Mine's this more hat like could a, talk. Mine's more oh. like the military looking ones, mm -hmm. like a fisherman will wear, that kind of thing. That's mm -hmm. a little stiffer. Okay. Yep. I so see. so this is my summer protect my head thing because it's ventilated and it's a wide brim. And um, Now, granted, if I'm hiking, I'm wearing a util kilter or a really a grubby tartan kilt. I'm not wearing this one. Um, but I don't know. You guys tell me. How bad is it? With the kilt. Doesn't match. Nope. Doesn't match. Well, I got one that matches. Wait, you want one that matches? Here, hold that. It's a little greasy. This is my this is my this is my fall and winter hiking hat. Look at that. Okay. With or without a kilt, guys, you tell me. I mean, if I want to look good, I'm not sure I would do this. I could argue that I got like kind of a dashing <clears throat> cavalier kind of effect going on here, but but you know, I think the the point is it's not as over the top, I got a big old owl feather on it, but it's not over the top the way uh, some cowboy hats are out there, like fashion cowboy hats. Yeah, I think a fashion yeah. cowboy hat, which was uh, with his original, sides. Yeah. with his original point was um, that could be a little bit much. Yeah, but it's the, the cowboy hat is so inextricably linked to oh Jesus, uh, is so inextricably linked to I don't want video evidence of this, the, the two you know, cowboy culture to the boots, to the jeans and that kind of thing. Yeah. It's sort so of, it's, it's sort of Mac very much <laughs> crossing like, the stream. He's like, oh God. no, I'm, I'm watching the comments. We do have a, a few, uh, shout outs from Arizona coming through. So we're about, to. um, Prescott. Yes. Prescott. Our, our Arizona peeps. So we do have a my few family, things. My family's house there. is in Sedona. Don't hold it against me. The, um, um <clears throat> somebody's, uh, some people are saying no feathers. Um, but the black hat looks better. So, See, and you know why it's working, I think, better than the others? This is subtle. Subtle-ish. I mean, it's a wide brim, which we would not normally recommend, but it's not decorated. Okay? It's very basic. So, basic rule of thumb, if you if you think you need it, if you got to do this, then go simple. Okay? You know, yeah. like, when I was a kid, cowboy hats all had those feather, <clears throat> feather hat bands. It was all feathers on the big old bush of feathers in yeah. the front, big fan of feathers. No way. <laughs> it's ultimately it's none of this stuff, none of these are traditional. Nope. Period. Nope. These are all just do what you got to do in the circumstance that you are in. Um we're just giving you examples of I'm just having fun. I figured y'all might appreciate it. So. Happy someone's having fun. The no, it's it's just giving you examples of how it would look with a kilt and whether you think that's good, bad or indifferent. Ultimately, it's up yeah. to you. I don't like the look, but if I'm, again, if it's to protect my head, I'm going to do what I'm yeah. going to do. And yeah. then at that point, I don't care. The kilt is almost secondary, but I'm not wearing it to a black tie dinner or to represent my clan. Right. So I would, for a sun hat, I'd go, I'd go with something like the Barma. Keep it simple, undecorated. Um, again, like we were saying about formal dress, the, you know, the attention goes to the sporn. Well, you know, casual dress, the attention is naturally going to go to the kilt. People who are not kilt wearers are going to see you. And the first thing that's going to go there, you know, they're going to notice is, boop, he's wearing a kilt. 
Um, so if it's kilt and a cowboy hat, they're going to be like, Err? but the simpler the hat is, the the better it is. <laughs> With now, the record scratch. So, so now I've, I've defaulted to something that looks more traditional. What do you think? <clears throat> this is actually, a, this is a French beret given to me by a French lady. Um, but yeah, closer to like a tan. It's closer kind of to thing. a tan. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the, the, the point Mac brought up that he read online or read on the, in the comments that somebody said is about not wearing feathers. Um, it's what that person is kind of alluding to is not wanting to wear eagle feathers to, you know, represent that you're an armager of a right. clan or a clan chief right. or something like Don't that. Do that. Um, what Eric just has a regular hat that happens to have a feather in it, which outside of Highland wear is not a no, no, especially with just an owl feather. It's not an eagle feather. Right. Make sense? What? What's going on? <laughs> Somebody just put uh, uh, John uh, on uh, on YouTube. Just put he he looks a lot like Jamie from MythBusters. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've heard that before. You should see when I got the goatee. I mean, when, I'm, when I'm doing the goatee, yeah, I've heard that before. But I I happen to like the style of hat. There <clears throat> there's some old shows where I've worn it the whole through a whole show. Yeah. Um, but um, I think this looks better with a kilt than anything else. We're Scottish MythBusters. No. Yeah, we are. Kind of, yeah. We actually are. Yeah. yeah. So, okay, that is the end of my lesson Lost in myths for the day. and cracking skulls. Yep. Well, that's a different kind of hat. You got to have a helmet for that, but there you go. So No, you you can't wear the helmet if you're going to crack the skull. Uh, well, yeah, okay. You need the helmet to be off to crack If the it's skull. competitive skull cracking, then well, you're each wearing a helmet. Well, but skull cracking challenge. Are you not entertained? You want me to take this off now? We're horrible people. I like, I like this hat. But, All right. Okay. Mr. Mac, next question. Visual, visual representation from this from my, from my goofiness. All right, we have uh, Michael asking: Are sport and straps considered day wear, or can they be used for formal outfits? <clears throat> I don't think there'd be any reason not to use a strap. Yeah, um, right. you could. Uh, it's when it comes to formal wear, generally it's again it's the peacock and the rubber peacocks thing. Um, a lot of guys like to have shinier, glittery, you know, not glittery, but you know. Yeah, shiny, you know, a little, little bit of bling bling, bing bing, um, stuff. Sound effects, <laughs> sound effects button right here on the table. Sure. Um, but uh, yeah, it's when you go formal. Generally, you want to have more shiny bits. You don't generally have, you know, antiqued kilt pin. You don't generally have antiqued buttons. You generally, you know, it's shinier the better. Um, it's just generally made to to emulate silver. So, you you could wear a spore and strap, but you can also wear spore and chain. They make super duper fancy spore and chains with, you know, different types of yeah, lengths. With the, the plackets. Yeah. Yeah. Or uh, filigree chains and like all kinds of different stuff. Yep. So it's, you kind of make it your own. And if your, if your comfort level and your, your look, your, your personality coming through in your outfit is simple, understated, but classy. Yeah. Spore and strap is fine. Yeah, I think it would be fine. I would say the, the only caveat would be um, a sporn strap is going to show wear a lot sooner than a chain is, obviously. So um, if it's the same sporn, ch sporn strap sporn strap that you're using every single day, you might want to take a good hard look at it to make sure it doesn't look like beat up or the leather is chewed on the edges or, or the finish is weird. Um, if it's nice and crisp and new and, you know, clean, then, yeah, for an understated... Especially these days. Again, like we said, things are in flux. But for a very understated look, you might be able to get away with it just fine. Yeah, yeah. agreed. I wouldn't wouldn't be my choice, but I think you could do it. Yeah. Yeah. You do you. Ish. Do we need a you do you? Probably. Thing now. I've Probably. said it a couple times. We're going to do a montage sometime of all of our goofy graphics and all of our goofy expressions. Because we got like Gridular. We got It's Not a Thing. We got Shaggy Dog. Yeah. We got the, the BS Detector. Um, we, need, we need one for floppily dobbly too. I still like well, floppily dobbly. And full disclosure, I did steal that from Blackadder. No, not me! The actors downstairs, they're anarchists! Anarchists? Yeah, I heard them plotting. They're gonna poke out your liver, turn me into wristhole, and then suck on your exquisite floppily doppelies. I want, like, Optimus Prime to come up behind me. In a kilt? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Or Megatron to, like, shoot us in the head. <laughs> Our heads explode. <laughs> because we're wearing cowboy hats. Yes. Well, yeah. well, that's a fair point. <laughs> You can't you can't take the cowboy out of the man. You take the man out of the west, but you can't take the cowboy out of the man. I don't think that's how those sign phrases go, but close. I'm just I family's from Arizona. Yeah. That's the way it goes. You can take the man out of Arizona, you can't take the Arizona out of the man. 
is how yeah, that goes. Yeah, I went a little broke back there, maybe. I don't know, but <laughs> whatever. Mac, you got another question? Different thing altogether. I blame the Jameson. <laughs> Mr. Mac. Keychain 2006 did bring up, on, on, it's on, on Twitch, by the way. Um, yes. Did, did bring Thank up you, uh, Autobots roll out. Roll out. Yeah, that's good. That's good. That, but our, our end to our thing is, is you know, Slanja or Slanjava. So, like, <laughs> we can get somebody to, <laughs> if, if somebody can out. translate roll out. Slanjava, Autobots, roll out. <laughs> well, we get somebody to translate into Gaelic. I'll ask, I'll ask, I'll ask uh, Jonathan or somebody to translate into Gaelic for us. There's never gotta, say never. There's gotta be. I never like the never. I like the rollout. He's right. He's right on that one. But there's got to be something else from from Transformers. Let's answer some questions. Let's no, try. I want to talk about the Autobots. Oh my god! <laughs> Damn it! I love the Autobots. <sighs> Mac. Trans or Z? Mac. Maybe some other Smurfs. Oh, you want to do? <laughs> you want to get into anime? Because we could go that way. Gummy too. bears bouncing here and there and everywhere. High adventures oh beyond. Court. We just need like all of the '80s cartoons <laughs> in the background here. New shelf idea. Scrap the tartan books. All 80s cartoons. I'm down with that. Sweet. Do you have any idea how many 80s toys I've got at home I could bring in on the <laughs> shelves? All, we're going to build a set out I'll of bring it. I'll bring in the museum. We nice. should go to a science fiction con, man. Do a road show. Fair. Do I, kilts I, and culture I, I at a con. I do strike a very nice Jamie Frazier Kilt, type. Kilts yeah. and contour. 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 That's a stretch. That's a stretch. Okay. okay. All right, next, Mac. Well, well, Brendan did say that uh, we could all dress up as Ninja Turtles. You know, each that's each right. He tart, wanted to do that. A different. I think that's everyone a great wearing a different idea. Color yes. I think it's a fantastic idea. Yeah, yes. Ninja Turtle tartans would mm -hmm. be great. Yeah. Okay, let's do a question. All right, I'm so, calling Michelangelo because he's orange. Cut, I gotta go flyers. Uh, all right, <laughs> sign. Sorry. All right, so we have Back Richard James. asking uh, from YouTube how uh, how do we celebrate St. Patrick's Day? Is there any traditions <laughs> that we uh, y'all use us as the the whole company just as just individuals individuals there's so many people in this building was it like 16 17 people 18, now? yeah 18 people i think you're gonna we'd have a lot of answers if i tried to think about the whole company but just the two of us it's probably a lot easier a long nap <laughs> <laughs> the, yeah <clears throat> well in fairness i'm not working you know 80 hours a week making kilts at this point anymore either that's mac mm -hmm. needs the long nap after patty's day um <clears throat> usually for me usually it's uh, Kelly's family is Irish and we get over to go over to her house and I know it's not Irish, but they do the corned beef and cabbage thing. Um, we just kind of hang out with family, relax, nothing big and crazy. I used to, uh, yeah, in my, in my twenties back when I was young, um, <laughs> used to go out to the bar and do all that kind of stuff, you know, see right. the, the shanties, the bogside rogues, the hooligans, and, you know, basically tour Love around guys. the Philly area with the bands. Um, but yeah, it's as I get old and curmudgeonly and hate people. Um, I just go to, uh, you know, relaxed family type thing this year. We have a, we should do, we should do a live with all of us at the thing. Um, uh, this year, what um, the, uh, I, uh, I go to a lot of different flyers games. So we got five tickets and the, a bunch of the production staff who likes the flyers on St. Patrick's day. We are taking off early we're heading down at three o'clock to go tailgate and then drink and party and watch flyers while cool. celebrating saint patrick's day in the old and, irish manner yes as you yes. do as you do okay to celebrate the orange team on saint patrick's day god <laughs> yeah yes. we won't touch that next what do you do for saint patrick's day not not a lot to be honest my my ancestry is much more scottish to continental um I have a lot of interest in Irish history and folklore, um, but I'm definitely on the side of the snakes. So it's not so much uh, St. Patrick's Day for me this time of year as it is things like in bulk. Um, so that's that's where I, I land on it. We've done things like um, I do really love to uh, watch the live simulcast of the parade in New York. That that is fantastic. <clears throat> I do love to you know I love to turn on the parade and have that going. Um, and we will have something Irish. Um, more along the lines of uh, like shepherd pie or something like that, you know, soda bread, whatever my wife feels like making. Um, it's about the hominess yeah, for us. Family. You know, it's about the it's about you know the home life and and uh, natural cottage life, if you will. Because um, that's really it's that's I think in in that sense I think it's what about it's about is that it's a it's a working man's holiday. Um, it's not the the gentry 
of Ireland. It's not the uh, it's not the Northern Ireland as much in some ways. It's not the Ulster folks. It's, it's not basically really celebrated that way. It's yeah, but I'm just thinking starting to. But yeah, but I think about uh, I think about uh, I think about hu humble folk. Yeah, it's, but it's more yeah. of a, it's over in Ireland. It was more of a religious holiday where sure. everything was closed down. Sure, but now it's it's basically in America. It became a big party, and then now. Americans going to Ireland for St. Patrick's Day, it's starting to become a party because people want to have that same experience over there and they're expecting yeah. it, even though it's not how it was done, but it's starting to become that way. Mm -hmm. Random tangent question. Matt, you can answer that for, for, okay. for the three of us. Okay. <clears throat> kids, if you are under 10 years old, turn this off. I don't want to ruin things. Oh, boy. Turn it off. Parents, put your kids away. Um, put call them out of the room. Away. Put them away. It's... As if they're things. <laughs> Call them out of the room. Anyway. It's a heck of a show do, do Do your kids think that leprechauns are real? In the same way that a good Santa is real or the Easter Bunny is real. Because when I was little, it was, you know, leprechauns are like, they're fun little things. But you never like, oh, the leprechauns are coming to visit or, you on St. Patrick's lepre Day. leprechaun traps. Yeah, you have like, you're mm -hmm. supposed to pour green food coloring in the toilet. And you have little tiny gold pieces that are left around. Yeah. Like, it's yeah. it's getting a bit nuts. It's yeah. like, I don't want my kid to believe that, like, like everything is like magical, mystical world. It's like, I don't know. Mystical, yes. Magical, no. The, um... Yeah, um, that's a comment. That's remember, the question, and yeah, you people out there answer that too. Do you tell your kids that leprechauns are real, and when do they find out that they're maybe not real? Kids, go away. <laughs> do you want? Did you want me to answer? You want yeah, Mac to answer? Everyone, but I want the people out there first? to answer too. I, I, my guess. We, we've never done that. I, yeah. the preschool Liam's preschool did it, and his school is kind of continuing it to a degree, and it's. I don't know yeah. if it's like a fun thing for the kids to do, but mm -hmm. now it's like I'm I'm forced to lie, or else mm -hmm. I'm going to have him ruin it for the rest mm -hmm. of the kids at the school. Yeah, yep. they haven't touched on Ellie's at Ellie's uh, preschool. Also, maybe they maybe maybe they have. Yeah. And wait a couple weeks. I haven't heard about it yet. Yeah, we'll it's see. it's a school thing, and to me, it's the uh, I'm going to get on my soapbox here a little bit. Um, it's the American tendency to try to overdo everything. Okay, um, I think there's a mercantile aspect to it. I think there's a there's a merchandising aspect to it for sure. Um, it reminds me of the Elf on the Shelf, and uh, we dealt with it a little bit when my son was in preschool and kindergarten. Patrick on the knapsack. So, well, sort of, not quite, but <laughs> but it was we were told that we were supposed to put out a gift or a, or, a, or a food or something for the leprechaun, so the leprechaun would leave him a gift. I'm like, what? No. Um, so we basically, we nip that in the bud. <laughs> They're not real. It's a lie. No, well, we're not, not letting you go Well, the way I couch it was basically, we are, we are, we're not an Irish family, really. We are a Nordic family. Leprechauns are not likely to come to our house. And you, so if you Fair. want to put out a treat for a leprechaun, you could, but I don't think he's going to give you a present. You know? Okay. And, and, and that pretty much... That took care of it, but I, just it, feel weird I, I resented. Why. Well, yeah, no, I resented the fact that the school was basically imposing a gift buying excuse on us. Another, yeah, another. Oh, don't get me started. Get the stuff thing. Yeah, you know, another. You know, get a gimme thing on us. Yeah, you know. So, Mac. well, we uh, yeah. there's um we, there's a gentleman on here uh, saying that it's even becoming a thing on the east coast of scotland that's very interesting <laughs> to me i mean I, we i very very briefly touched on this in the leprechaun video we did the fact that um the american concept of the leprechaun has gone international as a concept as an icon for fun and all this kind of thing and you've got the leprechaun museum now in dublin and uh you've got st patrick's day parties and parades in asia you know it's becoming a th it's awesome. definitely a thing it's this ma it's part of the american macroculture that's being exported so yeah yeah but you know i think it's up to us as families individually to decide whether we're going to buy into it or not and there's nothing wrong with being a little selective with your family traditions you know there's nothing wrong with, with saying no this is let me tell you about our our customs our roots yeah you know and and stuff you know and on the other hand if you're into it yeah fine. It, there's Go nothing it. wrong with it i just feel weird when it's it's the thing that I didn't grow up with, or and or it's a thing that's being forced on us 
like hey don't ruin this for the rest of the like but now i have, the, now yeah, I have it's to do the, it too it's 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 when the it's when the it's, it's when the schools buy into it because somebody's really into uh shamrocks in their scrapbooks yeah or something like that you know you know if you put out a firecracker on the eve of fourth of july uncle sam will come and give you an apple pie Sweet. it's a thing it's now officially an american holiday tradition Sweet. Uncle Sam will come in the night. You know he was based on a Scottish guy? Yes. Uncle Sam? Yes, he was. Yep. Yep. And that's how we tie it all together. <laughs> and yeah. Indeed. That's a that's a it's an interesting concept. And uh St. Patrick's Day is a huge holiday and has a lot of different aspects to it these days. I I personally like it as a as a way to, <clears throat> to try and wrap up where I was coming from. I don't know if I was effectively, but I'd prefer to use it as a thing, as a as a occasion to think about the roots of Irish and Gaelic Celtic culture, you know, but that's how I roll. I think it's, it's, I'm more interested in the hell of Terra than I am in, uh, diddly diddly dee potatoes. Yeah. In, yeah. Into, into Darby O'Gill and the little people. Yeah. You know, okay. I guess. Uh, yeah. Don't hate me. Fair enough. Now, if anybody wants to buy me a drink at the pub for St. Patrick's day, I'll gladly come along, but I'm not putting on any green shamrocks. No. No, I'm not a green shamrock wearing yeah. guy. Yeah, Stephen Hardy uh, <coughs> was asking, um, are tweed kilts usually hemmed instead of using the selvage for the bottom hem? Yeah. <coughs> the selvage edge on the bottom of the loom, when the loom you know, actually physically weaves the cloth, it's usually done with a selvage edge or a tuck-in selvage. You know, basically, it's the, the fabric ends nicely it's not fringed it's not a lino selvage you don't have to cut it off right that's how it's done with tartan kilts on tweed and frankly on the majority of cloth worldwide um the the selvage doesn't matter most people when you're making a suit or when you're making a shirt or whatever you're not cutting the pieces out for the garment from the very very edge of the cloth you're actually cutting them out in the middle so in a kilt it matters Unfortunately, tweed is going to be woven for the most part on a different type of loom, or even if it is woven on a rapier loom or a, a daub cross loom so that it's a traditional selvage, the problem is it's if it's a herringbone tweed, the, the chevrons, the little Vs, are going to be going warp down the entire length of the cloth, the cloth, not up and down. So it'll look a little odd if you're wearing a tweed kilt and you have the chevrons if you just like horizontal. Like yeah, it'll give yeah. you that, that horizontal like kind trim. of effect yeah. versus a vertical effect. And when you're doing something on a kilt, you want your eye to be drawn up and down, not lengthwise or not widthwise, excuse me. Also, if you're wearing a tweed jacket and vest, what ends up happening is the jacket and vest are going to be cut so that they're vertical. The chevrons are going vertical on the, or the herringbone is going vertical on the jacket and vest. Then if your kilt is going horizontal, it's going to look odd and it's going, something's going to be off and you may not realize exactly what it is, but that's what it is. So ultimately what happens is from a kilt maker perspective, when you make a kilt out of tweed fabric, most of the time you have to actually cut sections of the cloth and then turn them 90 degrees and then you have a cut edge Then you have to hem it up and splice those pieces together to make a full kilt out of it. Right. Mac, do you have anything to add to that? Any thoughts about that? Or... No, you got it. Okay. <laughs> awesome. I got this. So says Ta-da. Mac. Indeed. So, yeah, ultimately for a tweed kilt, the majority of the time, yes, they have to be hemmed. There you go. And I will just add that, yes, tweed kilts are traditional, and there's nothing wrong with them. So. And now you know. Enjoy. And no one's half the battle. Roll out. Roll out. We need an Autobot, like, on the rainbow. Whatever. Yeah, there you go. Okay. Next, Mr. Mac. Friend of the program, Sean Smith, just... Uh, What's up, Sean? Yo, just, Sean. Just uh, said he got a phone call from a friend in Ireland, and he asked him to translate roll out. And uh, <laughs> it did not translate well, so... He's going to get back to us with Even options. better. <laughs> okay. Speaking of tweed kilts and jackets... Okay. Yeah. Sean Smith. Yeah, he yeah, nice. actually just he made a comment about that earlier. Nice. Cheers. Um, before I get to a question, I do have the... Where did he go? Uh, JB on YouTube uh, says he's in a rock band and he we- and is now wearing his kilt on stage. 
cool. He wanted to thank you guys. Uh, he began wearing, he began watching our YouTube channel, and it gave him the courage to step out on stage in the kilt. Nice, nice. Well, awesome. <clears throat> Mission accomplished. I'm JB, done. I'm out. You confuse me. You have the guts to put your music out there. You have the guts to stand on a stage. You have, you already had the guts to wear a kilt. Getting on stage is more difficult than wearing a kilt. It's a different well, for you. thing, but, well, yeah, it's fair. Um, but, no, you got it. Done. That's awesome. Yeah. That's very cool to hear. Awesome. I want to see video, if possible. I want to hear, I want to know the band name. Yeah. That'd be cool. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, he's still watching, so maybe we'll, we'll uh, get Rock some out. stuff cool. over. Yeah, get the band up there, and then maybe someday you guys can perform in our studio. Yes. One thing I would say. If you're wearing a kilt on stage, remember the angle of the audience. <laughs> Drummers yeah. need to be concerned with wearing a kilt on stage. And the other people, you know, in the front row may get their money's worth for their ticket. <laughs> That's all I'm saying. Depends on what kind of show it is. Yes. Yeah. That's awesome. Mr. Mac. That made my day. Alrighty. So we have Pip asking on uh, YouTube, is it okay to leave a kilt pin on a kilt after use as in hanging it up in the closet? Yeah, um, there, it's, there's a couple it. different takes on it. Um, some people don't like poking the pin through the kilt. So I know some people will say, I have a kilt pin per kilt. They have 10 kilts, they have 10 kilt pins, and that is the kilt pin for that kilt. Other people think that it's going to, you know, pull at the cloth or hang slightly, and, you know, the weight of it, if it's a heavier kilt pin, yeah. the weight of it can kind of distort the threads a little bit. Um other people would say that, you know, they're concerned about, you know, pulling it in and out of their closet because the kilt pin is scraping against other articles of clothing and yeah. they end up, you know, pulling at the threads in the kilt. So it's your mileage, you know, it's it's whatever you want to do. Some people like it, some people don't. Ultimately, it doesn't matter. Yeah, I, um, I tend to be on the side of uh, leaving the pin in. I like to uh, insert the pin through the cloth as little as possible. <laughs> Um, to minimize, you know, potentially damaging the cloth. Um, I will change out pins for occasions on certain kilts, but I do certainly have certain pins which are my favorites to go with certain kilts, and assuming the kilt is comfortably between washings, then I will be inclined to leave that favorite pin for that kilt on that kilt so that I'm not poking more holes through the, through the fabric. I also try to find the original hole if I can, if I'm replacing a pin, and sometimes you yeah. can. Um... That said, you can also kind of move the fabric around, rub the fabric of itself to close the hole, um, because it's wiggle it, not rub it. Yeah, wiggle it. I'm trying to think of the right word, but um, um, the amount of damage that your pin would do to the kilt is pretty minimal. I mean, I think I guess the catching on <coughs> something makes sense, but I'm more concerned about a kilt pin uh, catching on things during the day than I am it catching on the edge of my closet door. I will point this out as well. If you leave the kilt pin on your kilt as your de facto. The only issue is you're not thinking about it. And if you want to take your kilt to a Maybe. dry cleaner and you leave the kilt on when it goes to the dry cleaner, either A, mm. it's going to catch the stuff in the big drum or B, it's you're, they're going to lose it. And then you're going to not have a kilt pin on it. So that's a reasonable risk, yeah. I guess. Yeah, so you got to make sure that you remove the pin before you get it clean. Yep. Yeah, I can see that. And since my memory is absolutely shot, I wouldn't do that. Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I'd forget to do it. Yeah, yeah, but I've I've uh, I've had times when I was vacuuming, like when I was vacuuming production or something in the old days, and the the cord of the vacuum would get caught on the yeah. top of my pin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that drove me up the wall. <clears throat> but um, I've never had a problem with leaving a pin on a kilt in the closet. Completely tangential story, just because I can. Okay. Twenty two years old, twenty three years old. Parents out of the house. Yeah. Pair of. Uh, painter's pants with the hammer loop. Okay. <clears throat> Big party. Oh, no. And the kitchen cabinets had, you know, the pulls, but it was like a little spike sticking up, a little spike sticking down. My pant hammer loop ripped the cabinet door off. Ooh. And I was, I was actually, didn't live there at the time. I was having a party at their house. My brother lived there still. And uh, I was like, yeah, uh... I had to run out to the store and figure out how to fix a kitchen cabinet before my parents got home. <laughs> yes. So, hmm. things catch on things and can destroy cabinet doors. Let that be a lesson to you. Yes, with kilt pins. My stories hey. make no sense. Yeah. 
long day. That's fine. Yeah, it's been a long week. Mr. Mac. Now, along those lines, is there anything with like magnetic kilt pins? Do they exist? Are they a thing? Are they not yeah. a thing? I've they seen do. them. They scare me a bit. I don't trust them. Um, yeah, it's yeah. I don't, it, it's to me, it would pull. It could potentially pull off. It's got to be a really strong magnet. Um, the ones that we do ourselves are exclusive kilt pins that we do. We actually have two stick pins on the back with like the butterfly clasps. Um, to try to affix it to the kilt better um, and a little bit flatter, frankly speaking, and than a regular and at two points, yeah, yeah, than a regular pin. Um, there's also the rubber band trick on how to keep your kilt pin attached to your kilt in case the clasp comes undone. But uh, yeah, yeah, there's um, lapel pins, enamel pins, and, and insignia pins for geek stuff. Uh, their magnetic are becoming a lot more popular. Like Star They're Trek, not Star Trek, yeah. yeah. But the my the the magnets are very strong if you're just putting it through, um, like a light jacket material or shirt material or something like that. If you're trying to use that same pin that has a magnetic back through yeah. kilt wool, it doesn't work as well. It's yeah. not and nearly multiple as layers. Strong. If you have the fringe, the return that's on the fringe yeah. right there, and you're trying to go through you know four or five layers of cloth. Yeah, yeah. and I know because I've tried, and I'm just like, oh yeah, that's gonna come off today. That's not gonna work. So. Yeah. Um, yeah, I wouldn't. Stick with the mechanical. Cool. Yeah. All right, we'll do one more from each. You want to go a little longer because we we're shaggy dogging so much, or eh, we don't have to. Eh, but... Well, it depends how long these go. Okay, true, Mr. Mac. True that. All right, this will be uh, <clears throat> kind of a quickie one for you. Um, Matt on Facebook is asking, wearing ties with a kilt, is there a particular knot to use? I use a half Windsor or a Windsor knot. Yeah. When same. I'm wearing a, a necktie with a kilt. The it is a British looking thing. It is you know of the UK. It's a wider knot. Um, the dress shirts are almost as important as the type of knot. I will get a spread collar shirt. Um, think uh, think what's the the the, the mobster movie um, from the eighty casino or whatever when they have the the Italian co- collars. Uh, ah darn what? it! What's the mobster what? movie? Goodfellas? Goodfellas. Yeah, yeah. With Goodfellas. a ridiculous collar on top of the. Yes, I'm going the exact opposite okay, direction. Okay, from that. you're the extreme. Yes. Okay. It's an Italian style, which is why they were in a mobster movie, of like basically like very, very skinny, like uh, amount of tie showing, and they were very long peaked things, and they were kind yeah, of parallel straight down. Bloody awful. Yes, it was from the 70s. Yeah. Um, don't do that. Do the opposite of that. Um, the, the British thing is like a very, very spread collar. So the collar actually comes way out on the side to expose yep. more of the knot. And that's why the Windsor knot or half Windsor as a wider knot will work better for you versus something that's like a, a skinnier knot, like the half knot. Yeah. Typical, you know, like how yeah. you learn to tie a like tie a three when you're a kid. Or whatever, yeah. 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 Um, basically, yeah. That's uh, Other than that, you don't really need to overthink it. But uh, consider how how far out the uh, the collar of your shirt is spreading, and then adjust accordingly. I think a Windsor is always a better option. Yeah, it's a, it's a good so. classic simple knot. I would say this for for my money. <clears throat> In Highland wear, generally less is more, and right. the more uh, I've seen uh, when I was learning how to tie a Windsor knot and learning other different knots to tie, I experimented with a bunch of different stuff. And there are some very, very elaborate YouTube videos on like crazy pinwheel knots, Especially all kinds now. of stuff. Yeah, yeah, it's the thing. It's a hobby. Yes. So, and it's it's like it's the dandy thing. It's a cool, fun thing to differentiate yourself, like you know, different color socks with mm-hmm. your suit. Um, but I would say don't go too crazy on the necktie knot. Mm-hmm. A simpler, classic style knot is going to look better with a classic mode of dress, i.e., Highland wear, than right. something very you know avant-garde and yeah. artsy. And, and the reason the artsy knots have become a, a fad right now is because a suit is a suit is a suit. They don't have what we have with the sporn and the kilt and everything yeah. being as attractive as it is. It's just like, it's a suit. How can I make the suit look interesting? Okay, well, I'll play with a tie. I'll play with a knot. That's that's the way it's always been. That's why tie fashions have changed. You know, prints on ties have changed for years because of that, because the rest of the suit is boring. Um, so we don't have that problem. I will say one, one thing, one caveat would be if you're using a traditional wool tie, um, the material is a lot thicker. So you may find that the half Windsor is a better option for you just because of the thickness of the cloth as opposed to a silk tie, which you may be used to. Um, I've done a Windsor with the wool ties. You have too. 
Um, it takes a little more practice, and and the and the links I use are a little different because the the cloth is so thick. And I've had a couple times where it's like I'm done. It's like <coughs> giant knot. And it's like okay, I better do this a little differently. Um, but uh, well, yeah, I'd, that'd uh, be my only caveat. I'd say this as a as an editing note: when we cut this up into a snip, let's include some links below for different YouTube videos on good YouTube videos on how to tie a Windsor knot, how to tie a half Windsor, those kind of things. So if anyone's watching this video later on after we cut it up. You get some cool links on where to tie stuff. You can do that. Yeah. You can cool. do that. Yeah. Very good. Mr. Now, Mac. Would bow ties be that fall in similar in a similar aspect? With that with tying them? Or we or is that just It's not too many variants on tying a bow tie, are there? There yeah. probably are at this point. I, think I don't think know. there are I, last time I Couple. looked when I was looking My bow ties out. are pre tied. <laughs> so uh Eric? I yeah, I mean I'm more concerned about the shape of the tie. Uh, which I may have commented on before that um, there's kind of a middle ground with bow ties where it's like not too thick and and fluffy and not too thin. If it's a very thin narrow tie, it looks very retro, kind of 60s or ultra modern. Yeah. Um, if it's a big flop floppily doppily tie, then it looks kind of cartoonish or very clown 1970s like. yeah. or clown like or Doctor Who like or something. Um, so go with a just a standard conservative tie as opposed to a trendy bow tie. That's be more my concern. With yeah. the bow ties is, is make sure it's not a too trendy of a tie. No, you can you can wear a bow tie with a kilt. You absolutely can. I don't want can. to dissuade that. No, yeah, you absolutely um, can. If your a bow tie is a certain type of personality, some guys just bow tie guys love bow ties. Period. Yep. Yes, saw... you can wear it with a kilt. <clears throat> um, just yeah, just again look at the traditional end of it. Look at the classic kind of look for it. You're yep. dressing in Highland wear, which is a classic type of clothing. So you want to have a more long-standing thing with the yeah. bow ties. Yeah. yeah. Pretty much. Exactly. All right, Mr. Eric, let's do one of yours. All right. I know you've been wanting to answer this one, so I'm going to do this. What this one what we got? This one is from Mary in Washington. <clears throat> um, I don't know if she meant Washington State or D.C., probably State. Um, this is a big one. How did the modern kilt come to be? Uh, after learning the ancient Highlanders put on a great kilt, I started to wonder where the buckles and the straps came from that we have on today's modern kilts, and why are the pleats sewn <coughs> down the way they are? Um, when did these styles separate and become independent things? You know more about history stuff, so let me let me take a stab at it from a uh, an educated guess, if I had to guess, and then you confirm or deny based on what you know. Um, <laughs> okay. The what little I know. Go for you it. know more about history stuff than I do. Go for it. Um, the kilt started out as the great kilt, the Philomore, um, which was the tall piece of cloth, you know, four or five yards of cloth. They would hand pleat, wrap around them, top and bottom half. From there, it kind of evolved, um, potentially with an Englishman, whole other video, check that out, um, on whether an Englishman invented the half kilt or it was a Scottish guy, whatever. Either way, it's still basically wrapped, hand pleated, and it was just the lower portion, basically from the waist down half of the fabric <clears throat> basically correct and from there it kind of it, it just continued to evolve so from there it kind of went to a pleated garment that was sewn in so you didn't have to hand pleat it um and then from there you had to figure out a way to close it so instead of just wrapping it around like a bath towel and holding it on with a belt it evolved into um like a, like ties like ribbons that you would tie it on the one side um, and then from there, those are kind of, <clears throat> I don't want to say chintzy, but they could rip and tear off over time. So from there, it kind of became, okay, let's put some leather straps on it. And it just became more and more tailored. Um, if I had to guess, I would say the military fashions and what the military wanted for uniforms had mm -hmm. a lot to do with it, especially mm -hmm. as people got out of the military and still had the kilt. And the civilian market tends to kind of emulate the military yes. look. Um so I'd say it just kind of evolved over time. There was no set, aha, turning point moment. It was a practical Scott coming up with an idea saying, hey, I can do this thing. Like instead of just wrapping it around and holding it on with a belt, eh, let's put some ribbon on there and I can tie it closed. That way I don't have to kind of lay down and put the belt on. I can stand up and put the belt on. And someone goes, hey, that's a good idea. And then after a while, hmm, let's put leather straps on instead of the, the, the cloth straps or cloth ribbon. Hey, that's a good idea. And whatever was a good idea just kind of stuck. Um, and that's kind of how it would evolve. That's my guess. How far am I off? 
No, that's pretty perfect. That's a pretty perfect overview. Um, the Occam's Razor, from, from what I know, um, the military connection is paramount with this. Um, and uh, Mary, is it Mary? Yeah. yeah, Mary, you're saying uh, when did the styles diverge? They didn't diverge a huge amount in the sense that it's more that the one became in use and the other one kind of faded into history. Um, I don't think you have a huge number of people in the late 18th through the Victorian age wearing uh, the great kilt, uh, except maybe as a, a romantic costume kind of a thing, especially by the Victorian time when everything's getting romanticized. The uh, We know that in the 18th century, um, like in the Seven Years' War, for instance, a lot of the Scottish regiments that were wearing the kilt, troops started to complain about the various elements of the uniform getting in their way. And this varied from uh, swords and dirks to the kilt. And um, there's a couple, I think there's a good um, uh, Men at Arms series book on this about uh, Scottish regiments in the, in the 18th century. Um, and one of the points that I remember from reading that was that um, the history of using the kilt as part of the regimental uniform went up and down. It varied from group to group and it uh, came in and out of fashion sometimes. But they were among the first people to say, you know what, this great kilt is a pain in the butt. I can't do anything with this. It's constantly getting in my way. Um, and, and that's men in the line. And then you have officers saying, yeah, we can't, I can't put these guys in maneuvers in tight formations very well because these kilts are in the way. So they, they very quickly got into using the, the short kilt. Um, and uh, it went from there, basically. Okay, we're still wearing the kilt. We are mandated to wear the kilt. It's part of the honor of the regiment. And we're going to keep wearing it. But it's still kind of inconvenient. So how can we make it more efficient? Well, let's try putting some ties on, you know, and then let's try changing those out for straps or let's try doing, you know, this, that, and the other thing. Let's start sewing this down so it looks more regimental and it's more convenient. So that's essentially what happened. Yeah, the earliest, um, I think, I believe according to Matt Newsom, the earliest evidence we have for a kilt that looks like a modern kilt is from the 1790s. Um, and they, the, the, but the, the attachment points were definitely not what we're used to. Yeah. The pleating existed. Um, military, they started to pleat to the line or to the stripe. Um, and civilians who started wearing the kilt started doing the same thing, but they were not worrying about how it was pleated. They didn't, they weren't worried yeah. about it looking uniform. That's so they just kind of put it together. And if you had weird lines in the back and mismatched stuff in the back, you didn't care. But later on, they started to care. And that's why fabric started getting added to the kilts because you wanted to make sure that the pleats in the back looked uniform and looked nice. And then somebody got the idea of pleating to the set and that required even more fabric. So that's where you went from four yards to five yards and eventually to eight yards. what we consider an eight yard kilt. And then now back down again as people want easier Lighter to wear kilts. Yeah. So Mac, I know you know a lot of this stuff too. So no, Well, I was just going to ask you if you knew, um, we actually had a question come in as you were talking, okay. uh, asking about if we knew when the hip strap came in and, and got included in this because you, you're getting to the point now where you're starting to add that, that stuff yeah. to it. Yeah, and I'm not, I'm not completely sure about hip straps. I know that they've been kind of idiosyncratic over the years. Um, I think a lot of guys will tell you that hip straps are not even, are not very traditional. Um, do they have hip straps on World War One kilts? Okay, they do. They you're you don't see, always see them on Victorian see a kilts. Mixture of stuff, but yeah, you do see a, you do see them occasionally. Yeah, They're, the hip strap, the lower right, the lower strap on the right hand side. Um, some people will say um, kilts should not have a hip strap. It right. should only be the top two waist straps. Other people like the third strap, or it's kind of expected. The major, the vast majority of kilt companies just automatically include it. Um, the argument against is it makes the apron pull weird if the hips aren't done properly um, or it's not made to the proper measurements, and it shouldn't. It shouldn't be necessary if the kilt is done properly. It shouldn't be necessary at all. I'm, I kind of would push back a little bit against that and say, on the you know on the on your left hip. You have the fell sewn down from the top of the kilt to the widest point of your rear end. On the right-hand side, you have the top buckle, the waist buckle, is only about two inches down from the top of the kilt. Yeah. So the connection point or where it's where it's being restricted is eight inches approximately down on the left-hand side and two inches down on the right-hand side. So your your front apron could kind of pull to the left if 
either A, it's not done exactly properly, or B, when you sit down, when your rear end expands and you're pushing out in different ways as your body is pushing out against the kilt. So the right or the, the, the hip strap on the right hand side help keep the front apron a little bit centered better as you're sitting, especially. So I don't know. I, I, I see why some companies don't want to do it. I understand that it's not 100% traditional to, you know, whatever time period necessarily. It really depends but, on what time period. Yeah, that's yeah. what I'm getting at. But yeah. it's evolved into that in the same way that the belt loops <clears throat> on the back evolved in from sport, from nothing to spore and loops to full on belt loops. Yeah. And even, and that stuff, the, 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 the attachment points, like we talked about before, Max talked about the fact that even by World War One, you had some kilts, and even World War Two, I think, you had some kilts that it was just being held on by the belt. You know, or it had a couple of strings, you know, like just shoelace like strings to hold it shut, and that's it. Um, so the evolution is not like a steady curve either. Um, I'd be interested to see what the earliest photographic or archaeological specimen evidence we can find of hip straps Historic. is. Yeah. Um, I wonder if they became more popular for the same reason that guys, um, especially in the World War One era, were using the blanket pins higher up on the leg to, that it maybe, to, to help keep things yeah. secure as another attachment point that maybe somebody, well, we could just put a strap there. You know, um, something Fair like point. that. But, um, yeah, it's, uh, but the basic answer is that it, it it is definitely 18th century, late 18th century, and very heavily influenced by the military's needs for practicality. So, yeah. Practical and evolves over time. It's fine because it goes yeah. from being very you know, practical considerations. Then now the kilt is a luxury item and a specialty <laughs> garment and national and all that kind of thing. But uh, and yeah. more practical than it used to be. Yeah. Well, except for wearing it as a sleeping bag. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. You don't have that anymore. No, you could, but you'd be awfully cold. So day plates. Like day plates are good for that. It's true. It's true. Or, or day plaids, if you prefer. Yes. Yeah. Attached with a brooch, or, or a brooch. A brooch. A brouch. What was yeah. that? Bro yeah. That I don't know. Exactly. I don't know. A penny thing. Your inflections may vary. <laughs> we'll do one more. One more? One more. One more? One more. Okay. One of mine or one of Max? You sure you want to do one of mine? Yeah. You have anybody who's been hanging on like like grim death all show waiting for their question? Are I they mean, chill? You guys chill? We've, okay. we've been uh, we've fallen behind on, the, on a lot of your stuff. <coughs> okay. Yeah. Okay, um, that's because we talk too much. But uh, I hope you guys have been having fun. We give having thorough, goals. informative answers. Yep. Well, we try. It also has to do with coffee and scotch or whiskey. <laughs> yeah, not scotch. That's not scotch. Today, not scotch. James McDonald the fifth, I believe. Uh, James McDonald the fifth is asking how many kilts do each of you own, and how did you choose the kilts? His situation is basically that his family came from Sky. He has a Lord of the Isles tartan. He's considering getting some others, but he can't decide if he even should because the family connection gets more and more tenuous for the other tartans. He wants them, but he's not sure if he should allow himself to have them because okay. the, the, the family connection gets more and more tenuous. So how many do we own and how do we decide what to own? <clears throat> with how many do I, I currently own somewhere in the 40s. Um, I've owned probably close to 100 easy. Um, the, uh, how I started was with universal tartans and one universal tartan and one utility kill, um, and kind of evolved over time. And then the more, the more tartans I saw and the more, you know, when we started the company, the more tartans that I, you know, was pouring through swatch books as if they were flashcards, you know, memorizing the tartans and, you know, seeing all this different stuff and the yeah. more that were opened up to me, the more I was like, Ooh, I really like that. And then I really like that. And then over time, my tastes have also evolved, like where I don't mind necessarily a purple one like Isle of Sky, or I like the brighter color ones, not just modern. Um, so I've grown to appreciate different ones. When it comes to family tartans, um, I, I'm trying to think my first clan tartan, I think was actually McGregor, which I jokingly, like I just liked the McGregor hunting tartan um, at that time. And I jokingly was saying, well, if my last name was Rager, it, the closest thing I got is MacRagger, but oh my god, I know horrible. it was a bad pun. That's I was, horrible. I was justifying it. Oh, uh, I know, rationalizing um, big time. Yeah. Yes, exactly. But it's also as a kilt maker, it was one of those where it's like I just liked certain tartans, like certain color palettes, and I had that kind of built-in defense of 
Is that your family tartan? No, I'm a kilt maker. Oh, okay. And it yeah, you got an easy out in that sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but I've gone from you know universal tartans to tartans I've designed because I wanted them to exist. German heritage being one. Um, through family tartans, through actual family tartans that I have affiliations with, just clan tartans I just happen to like, like the Canon Weathered um, State tartans. Mine kind of run the gamut. Yeah. So, and but you've never been concerned about the <clears throat> the clan affiliation thing. Not really, but again, because I have that built-in out of I'm yeah. a kilt maker, and then yeah. it it clicks for people. So, if in in his instance, would you say he should try to prioritize clan affiliated tartans first, or should he not worry about it? It's he he also said that he was like he has some tenuous clan affiliations. Yeah. So yeah, it's it's up to you. There's no hard. You're allowed to, or you're not allowed to. Right. It's what do you feel comfortable with? Some people. Will are of the the mindset that you must have affiliations with a particular tartan. Period. End of story. Yeah. And it's unacceptable for anyone else to do it. My standpoint on life, pretty much, is <laughs> if if it's not hurting you, leave me alone. So, <clears throat> in the same same kind of thing with clan tartans. If you want to only wear your clan tartan, great. Just wear your clan tartan. I hope you like the colors in it. Because right. you're kind of, you know, tie them on hand behind your back. But if that's how you want to approach it, there's nothing wrong with that. In the same way that if you have a great grandmother twice removed because you were and you're adopted, not know, whatever, and that's the family tartan that you choose to honor, have at it. If your wife's a Stuart and you're not Scottish and you want to wear a Stuart tartan, have at it. Yeah. Yeah, basically, I would say the only thing might be you could consider making sure you use the clan tartan for clan or family oriented activities. You know, maybe that's the one you wear to the wedding as opposed to the Isle of Skye or whatever it is. It just happened to float your boat. Yeah. You know, um, we are collectors. We are fans of tartan as an art form. We're not going to worry about clan affiliation. And we are far from the only people who say that you don't have to worry about it. Um, I think Scottish most tartans authority, exactly the Scottish tartans authority. And most people who are scholars in this field will say, no, there's no precedent for you having to be limited to wearing your family tartan. It is an elegant custom. Um, it can be a great way to boost pride and solidarity. It's got a lot of advantages to it. Um, but no, just collect and wear the ones you want to wear. Be a sincere student of the culture, no matter what you do. Yes. That's all you have to worry about. And the, the thing that I always um, go to anytime where it's been questions or getting discussions about it with people if somebody says, no, you're only allowed to wear your clan tartan, or you, you, know, you shouldn't wear anything but your clan tartan. Like I like to say, every custom, every custom was new at some point. Right. At some point, before clan tartans were officially recognized by the clan chiefs and adopted, you know, wholly, it was, tartan existed before that. There were district tartans. There were de facto district tartans, because this is what the weaver in this one area wove, and that's what everyone bought. And if everyone was from a particular family who lived in that area, it became their de facto family tartan. So it evolved over time. At some point, yes, it became a thing of this is the Buchanan tartan. This is the McDonald tartan. And that represents that family. But if you go back historically, before it was that, it was something else. Tartans were not invented out of the clan system. They existed before there was the, the associations with the clans. Yep. Absolutely. And that's all I have to say about that. To quote Forrest Gump. Mic drop. Yes. Careful. <laughs> dump, dump my coffee so I can drop it. Yeah. Very good. All right. Are we done? I think we're done. We're ready to... I need a nap. Mosey on out of here. Ready to hit the trail? Ready to mount up? Oh. I disavow any knowledge of him. Um, you wouldn't be the first. <laughs> Very good. All right, boys and girls. Thank you for sticking in. I apologize for Eric's hat. Question of the day. Would you ever wear a cowboy hat yeah. with a kilt? Or a wide-brimmed hat like Eric yeah, has on hat. with a kilt? I know what my answer would be. I'm scared what his answer is. But I want to know what you think. Anyway, so answer that in the comments for us. Until next time, boys and girls. It's Langeva. Bye con Dios.
Let's answer some questions. Let's no, try. I want to talk about the Autobots. Oh my god. Damn it, I love the Autobots. Autobots. Roll out.